I would like to uh, call uh, this hearing to order. Uh, as you know, this morning uh, we're having a hearing on EPA's proposed greenhouse gas standards for new uh, coal-powered plants, uh, and also uh, we're going we're having uh, we're going to touch on a discussion draft uh, legislation that has been introduced by myself, Senator Manchin. Uh, Morgan Griffith, David McKinley, John Shimkus, and, and many others in the Congress, that because of what w many of us view the extreme position in this greenhouse gas regulation that EPA has taken, uh, our legislation would allow uh, EPA to regulate greenhouse gases, but Congress uh, would set the parameters for that regulation. And our legislation uh, would apply to uh, new plants as well as uh, existing plants, uh, although they would be treated in uh, significantly uh, different ways. Just one year ago, James Wood, the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Energy's Office of Clean Coal, made this statement regarding CSS technologies. Unlike the cost-effective advanced technologies that were developed, to reduce emissions of nitrogen, sulfur, mercury, and particulates, technologies to capture and store carbon emissions from electric power plants are elusive, expensive, and although there are CO2 separation technologies in use in the natural gas and chemical processing industry, there has not yet been deployment in the electric power industry, and there is little history of the integration of these technologies with electric generation in reliable or cost-effective modes. So bottom line is we all know that EPA cannot point to a single completed operational facility that meets the emission standard it has set for coal in this proposed regulation. And all of the demonstration projects that they refer to have received huge government subsidies. All of them are cost overruns. None of them are in operation. Now, Section 111 of the Clean Air Act defines the term standard of performance as a standard for emissions of air pollutants which reflects the degree of emission limitation achievable through the application of the best system of emission reduction which the administrator determines has been adequately demonstrated. And that is the key word. And I would, I'm sure that Ms. McCabe, who will be testifying uh, um, later this morning, would agree and knows full well that there's going to be legal challenges on this proposed rule in the court system because they have gone a long way down the road that they've never traveled before and setting these demonstration projects as something that is adequately demonstrated that the technology uh, can work. So EPA is doing everything it can do with the backing of the president to move us down a road that we may not be yet ready to move down. Uh, as a matter of fact, when Congress addressed this issue the last time, the Democrats controlled the House and the Senate and uh, the Markey Waxman bill was rejected by the U.S. Senate. They could not get it through. And so now they're attempting to do by regulation what cannot be done uh, by, through legislation. And uh, <clears throat> so this morning we find ourselves living in a country where we're the only country in the world where you cannot legally build a new coal-powered plant because the technology is not available to meet the emission standard. Now, I recognize that people are not rushing out to build new coal-powered plants because natural gas prices are so low. But why in the world would a country struggling with economic growth, trying to be competitive in the global marketplace, say to its citizens and make a policy decision without a national debate that one of our most abundant resources will not be used in America. Now, 
people say, well, natural gas prices are so low, and they are, as I've stated. But what's happening in Europe? Over the, how many of you know that over the last 20 months, they're in the process of closing down 20 gigawatts, of, I mean 30 gigawatts of new natural gas plants? Why? Because the natural gas coming out of Russia is so expensive. So what happened last year in Europe? Well, we view Europe as a green, te green uh, arena, and I am all for all the above. So they moved quickly down that road. 22% of their electricity is produced from renewables. But gas prices are so high that last year they imported 45% of our coal export market, which was the highest uh, the, the largest export market we'd had in about 15 years. And so they're now building coal plants uh, in Europe because of the high cost of natural gas. So why in America would we make the decision that because low price, gas prices are low now, we're not going to allow a new coal-powered plant to be built? So that's what we're going to try to explore this morning. Uh, I understand there are different views on it, and obviously that's why we have hearings. Uh, but uh, I look forward to the testimony of all our witnesses today on an issue that's very important. This time I'd like to recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney, uh, for his five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a little chilly in here this morning, so uh, maybe we should turn on the coal-fired power plants and get yeah, things right. warmed up. Um, you know, I'm glad we're having this hearing, but I want, to make I want to make clear that this hearing is about climate change. The legislation focuses on the Whitfield Bill. The draft legislation would block EPA's ability to, to issue standards to limit carbon pollution from new and existing coal-fired power plants. It effectively rolls back EPA's authority under the Clean Air Act. The legislation nullifies EPA's proposed carbon standards for new power plants and prohibits future standards from being implemented unless at least six generating stations uh, units at different locations have met that standard for 12 continuous months. It's not clear why utilities would deploy any carbon pollution control technology in the absence of a requirement to do so. As a result, the bill's requirements appear to be insurmountable. In addition, the bill would require Congress to pass new legislation before the EPA could limit carbon pollution from existing power plants. Greenhouse gases pose a significant threat to our economy, to our public health, and to the environment. We've heard time and again from the world's leading scientists that greenhouse gases have negative consequences and are causing global warming. I share the view of many of my colleagues that we need a comprehensive approach to our nation's energy needs. Coal can continue to play an important role, but we must address carbon emissions. California still relies on coal power plants for some of its energy needs. However, California has been a national leader in clean energy generation and in reducing greenhouse gases. A Republican governor established short and long-term greenhouse gas emission reduction targets for California to reduce carbon emissions to 1990 levels by 2020 and 80 percent below 1990 levels by 2050. The state's carbon emissions have declined for three straight years. The development of carbon capture and te storage technologies is essential to the future of coal. The International Energy Agency expects carbon capture and storage to rank third among ways to reduce carbon emissions by 2050 behind energy efficiency and the, and the use of renewable sources and ahead of nuclear power. As far back as 2009, industry stakeholders we're talking about the benefits of carbon capture and sequestration. Although work remains to be done on carbon capture and sequestration, I believe that the current technological capacity exists to effectively deploy CCS technology on power plants. Taking away incentives for implementation of carbon capture and sequestration will stunt the progress that's been made in this industry to this point. We saw a similar 
a scenario play out in the wind industry back in the 1990s that I was involved in. The United States was building new technology and was leading the charge. But proper support went away, and so did the jobs and the technology. I saw those jobs leave this country. That set our industry back for years. As I said at the beginning of my opening statement, this hearing is about climate change. Either we believe that climate change is happening and is caused by human activities, or we don't. If we do believe that climate change is happening, this bill is exactly the wrong way to go. I want to thank the witnesses for their time, and I look forward to their testimony. And I'm interested to hear how we can support efforts to reduce greenhouse gases while boosting energy independence and protecting public health. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. McNerney. This time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, Michigan, Mr. Upton, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, nearly everyone claims to support an all of the above energy strategy, everybody. And in my view, all of the above allows every viable energy resource to compete. It doesn't take certain options off the table by setting unachievable federal regs. Unfortunately, it is the latter that has been on display by the EPA. EPA's proposed gas rule for new power plants is the latest effort by, the, by this administration to eliminate the use of coal. The president's energy strategy is the exact opposite of an all-of-the-above approach and would limit our energy choices, jeopardize jobs, raise energy costs, and threaten America's global competitiveness. An open all-of-the-above energy strategy is important because diversity of energy is critical to providing affordable and reliable electricity to U.S. homes and businesses. The nation has for decades benefit, benefited from a variety of sources of electricity. The idea that electricity from coal is no longer needed because we have more natural gas is misguided. And while our nation has become the envy of the world because of recent breakthroughs unlocking vast amounts of oil and natural gas, it never makes sense to regulate an entire fuel category out of the mix. It makes even less sense when the resource makes up 40% of the fuel used for electricity domestically, while at the same time other nations, from Germany to China, are continuing to build new state-of-the-art coal facilities. Given that the U.S. has the world's largest coal reserves and is the largest producer of coal, it should remain a critical contributor to a diverse electricity portfolio for decades to come. Fuel diversity not only gives us the flexibility we, we need to keep electricity costs low, it also helps ensure reliability. As we have heard from many witnesses in previous hearings, the coal-fired power plant shutdowns already underway pose a serious threat to reliability in many regions, particularly in the Midwest. That threat will continue to get worse if these shutdowns increase in the years ahead while we limit our options for new base load power. In sum... Fuel diversity gives us a more stable, reliable, affordable electricity supply, and, my, and any threat to coal, including EPA's proposed rule, is a threat to that diversity. I want to applaud both Chairman Whitfield and Senator Manchin from West Virginia for their efforts in authoring a workable, bipartisan, and bicameral alternative to EPA's proposed rule. Their proposal is a good-faith effort that requires a critical check on EPA's misuse of the Clean Air Act to try and accomplish through regulation what was rejected in Congress through legislation. Their approach does not prohibit the EPA from setting the standard for new sources, but instead focuses on setting standards that have been adequately demonstrated at geographically diverse locations around the country, a key ingredient that is missing from EPA's regulation, regulatory proposal. It deserves serious consideration by this committee and Congress. And I yield back my time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Upton. At this time, I recognize the distinguished gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The warning signs of climate change are happening all around us. But House Republicans are averting their eyes, denying the science, and jeopardizing the future of our children and grandchildren. Not only is this committee refusing to act, we're considering legislation to stop the administration from acting under existing law. The bill before us is a recipe for climate disaster. 
Last week, the World Meteorological Association reported that the levels of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere set new records. The levels are now higher than at any time in the last 800,000 years. Direct measurements and basic physics tell us that carbon pollution is warming the planet. Now, my Republican colleagues deny this scientific reality. I wish they would open their eyes and escape their congressional bubble. In my state, firefighters know that wildfires are getting bigger and more dangerous, and heat and drought become more common. Across the West, foresters are grappling with dying forests, killed by bark beetles that thrive in warmer temperatures. Farmers know the weather better than anyone else, and they say it's different now. Coastal communities confront ever-rising sea levels, putting them at risk from extreme storms and ever higher storm surges. And just last week, a super typhoon, perhaps the strongest ever recorded, demolished entire cities in the Philippines. Extreme weather, sea level rises, heat waves, droughts, floods, wildfires, pests. This is what climate change looks like. So what is this committee doing today? Denying, obstructing, and weakening the Clean Air Act. We will hear charges today that the administration is waging a war on coal. We will hear claims that EPA's rules will block all new coal-fired power plants. We will be told that we must pass legislation to effectively repeal EPA's existing authority to address carbon pollution from power plants under the Clean Air Act. And we will be told this is a reasonable middle ground. But we'll, we will hear no recognition of the dangers from climate change, much less, much less any suggestions for dealing with it. EPA's approach is actually very reasonable. For existing coal-fired power plants, EPA is starting by listening to stake stakeholders. EPA hasn't yet issued a proposal. For new coal-fired fire pl coal plants, EPA proposes to require partial use of carbon controls that are technically fe feasible, have been used in other industrial applications for years, and have been demonstrated on existing power plants. Several full-scale commercial applications of carbon capture at coal-fired power plants are currently under construction. Of course, these controls are more expensive than dumping carbon pollution into the air. That's why industry will never deploy them without government incentives or requirements. If this committee is truly concerned about the future of coal, it should be doing everything possible to advance the carbon capture technologies. That's the path to continued use of coal in a carbon-constrained world. That's exactly what Democrats tried to do in 2009. The Waxman-Markey bill gave utilities certainty about carbon regulation. It gave utilities with more coal generation extra allowances to help defray their costs, and it provided $60 billion, $60 billion to deploy carbon capture technology. That bill provided a future for coal. We worked with Representative Voucher, the coal miners, the utility industry, to make sure of that. But House Republicans said no. In the Recovery Act, President Obama provided $3.4 billion for carbon capture and storage technology. But House Republicans said no. So I asked my Republican colleagues, if you don't like President Obama's approach, if you don't like Congressional Democrats' approach, what's your plan for dealing with climate change? Just saying no, pretending it doesn't exist, is just a recipe for climate disaster. Yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Waxman. Uh, that completes the opening statements. And we have this morning three panels of witnesses. 
And on the first panel, we have, we're delighted to uh, welcome Senator Joe Manchin of uh, the great state of West Virginia, and he'll be our first witness. Senator Manchin is on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and he's also chairman of the Public Lands, uh, Forest, and Mining uh, Subcommittee. And I know you're on a lot of other committees as well, Senator, uh, but we welcome you and thank you for taking time to join us this morning. And uh, I will say that when Senator Manchin finishes his uh, statement, he's got to get over to a confirmation hearing. So I know that you all be disappointed. You can't <laughs> ask him any questions. But, but Senator Manchin, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you for inviting me and, and having me be part of this. My colleague from West Virginia, Congressman McKinley, good to be with you. Uh, and I want to, first of all, say that I do believe that 7 billion people on Mother Earth has had an impact on the environment. We have a responsibility. We also have 7 billion people that would like to eat and provide for themselves and their family. So we've got to find that balance. Um, the EPA regulation of greenhouse gas emissions from both new and existing power plants uh, are what we're talking about in this legislation that we proposed. Our legislation would protect Americans' access to reliable and affordable electricity now and for decades to come, finding that balance we talk about. We need a diverse energy portfolio, which I think, uh, Mr. Upton, you've talked about, and we sure do need that, a true all-of-the-above mix of natural gas, nuclear, renewables, oil, and coal. Unfortunately, the Environmental Protection Agency has chosen a regulatory path devoid of common sense that will take us uh, take us way off course from a future of abundant, affordable, clean energy. Our legislation tries to get the EPA back on track, but in a way that does nothing to prevent the EPA from acting in a reasonable and rational way. Mr. Chairman, EPA's proposed standards for new coal-fired power plants would effectively prevent any new plants from being constructed. Their standards require coal-fired power plants to deploy technologies that are not currently commercially viable. And though EPA has yet to formally propose new standards, for existing power plants, there is every indication that these standards will be unachievable as well. The EPA is holding the coal industry to impossible standards. And for the first time ever, the federal government is trying to force an industry to do something that is techno technologically impossible to achieve, at least for now. The industry is making steady progress, but it's still a ways off from developing the carbon capture and storage technologies that EPA claims are commercially viable. We don't have a commercially viable plant right now. Right now, coal provides 37 percent of all electricity generated in the United States, and the Department of Energy protects, uh, projects coal will provide at least that much through 2040. Right now, we simply can't make up the difference with renewables. That's just wishful thinking. So if we just stand by and do nothing and let the EPA eliminate coal from the energy mix, we're going to see stability of our electrical grid threatened and see the price of electricity rise dramatically jeopardizing America's economy and countless jobs with no real environment be environmental benefit. But we are just standing by. Our bipartisan, bicameral legislation is part of a national discussion about our energy future and the proper role of regulatory bodies like the EPA. Our legislation ensures that EPA will no longer be able to impose unachievable standards in coal-fired power plants. It is just common sense that regulations are based on what is technologically possible at the time they are proposed. <clears throat> With regulations, if they aren't feasible, they aren't reasonable. For new plants, our legislation will require that any, any EPA regulation must be categorized by fuel type, coal or gas. EPA can only impose a standard if that standard has been achieved for 12 consecutive months at six different U.S. electricity generating plants operating on a full commercial basis. For existing plants, any EPA proposed rule will not take effect until a federal law is enacted specific, specifying the rule's effective date, and EPA must report to Congress on the economic impact of the rule. Mr. Chairman, it's time we strike a balance between healthy environment and a healthy economy. That's all we've asked for is a balance. And that's what our legislation does. Abundant, reliable, affordable energy made this country the economic leader of the world. We'd all, we all wouldn't enjoy the life we have today if it had not been for the coal when produced by the hardworking people of, of this country. And that's the same formula that will keep us up at the front. It's time the EPA started working as our partner, not as our adversary, to achieve that balance. And the EPA can start by recognizing it is just common sense that regulations should be based on what is technologically possible at the time they are proposed. That's all we've asked for. 
Again, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and all the members of the committee here for allowing me to come before you, and thank you for the opportunity to work with you on this very important piece of legislation. Well, Senator Manchin, thank you so much for your testimony. I know all of us look forward to working with you as we move forward, and uh, we appreciate very much your taking time to come over and visit us on the House side. Well, it's good to be with you. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Thank you Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to say welcome to Senator Manchin. Welcome. I'm thank you, my friend. Yours. I'm delighted to see you in the committee this morning. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Dingell. You're my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dingell. At this time, I'd like to call uh, our second panel, and our second panel consists of one person, and that's the Honorable uh, Janet McCabe, who's the Acting Assistant Administrator for Air and Radiation at the Environmental Protection Agency. And I just discovered in talking to her before the hearing that she, she has a travel schedule like many of us do. She lives in Indiana and, and travels back and forth to Washington. So. Uh, Ms. McCabe, thank you very much for joining us today to talk about the proposed greenhouse gas uh, regulation and maybe the discussion draft, and uh, you're recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman <clears throat> and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on EPA's recently issued proposed carbon pollution standards for new power plants and the related discussion draft under consideration in the committee. Responding to climate change is an imperative. Is your microphone on, Ms. McCabe? The green light is on. Responding to climate change is an imperative that presents both an economic challenge and an economic opportunity. As President Obama and Administrator McCarthy have underscored, both the economy and the environment must provide for current and future generations. We can and must embrace cutting carbon pollution as a spark for business innovation, job creation, clean energy, and broad economic growth. In June, President Obama issued a National Climate Action Plan, which directs EPA and other federal agencies to take steps to mitigate the current and future damage caused by greenhouse gas emissions and to prepare for the climate changes that have already been set in motion. A key element of the plan is addressing carbon pollution from new and existing power plants. Power plants are the single largest source of carbon pollution in the U.S., accounting for about a third of U.S. emissions. In March 2012, EPA first proposed carbon pollution standards for future power plants, and after receiving 2.7 million comments, we determined to issue a new proposed rule based on this input and updated information. In September, EPA announced its new proposal. The proposed standards would establish the first uniform national limits on carbon pollution from future power plants. They will not apply to existing power plants. The proposal sets national, separate national limits for new natural gas-fired turbines and new coal-fired units. The standards reflect the demonstrated performance of efficient lower carbon technologies that are currently being constructed today. They set the stage for continued public and private investment in technologies like efficient natural gas and carbon capture and storage. The proposal is currently available to the public, and the formal comment period will begin when the rule is published in the Federal Register. We look forward to robust engagement on the proposal and will carefully consider the comments and input we receive as a final rule is developed. For existing plants, we are engaged in outreach now to a broad group of stakeholders who can inform the development of proposed guidelines, which we expect to issue in June of 2014. These guidelines will provide guidance to states which have the primary role in developing and implementing plans to address carbon pollution from the existing plants in their states. In addition to the proposed carbon pollution standards, I've been asked to provide testimony on the discussion draft that has been put forward by Chairman Whitfield and Senator Manchin. Although the administration does not currently have a position on the draft, I will offer a few points that I hope will assist the committee in its deliberations. The draft bill would delay action and regulatory certainty for future power plants by repealing the pending proposed carbon pollution standards. Further, it would indefinitely delay progress in reducing carbon pollution by discouraging the adoption of innovative technology that is available and effective today and would limit future development of cutting edge technologies. The draft bill could also prevent timely action on the largest source of carbon pollution in the country, the power sector, by prohibiting EPA rules from taking effect until Congress passes legislation setting the effective date of the rules. For over 40 years, 
state and federal regulators have worked with stakeholders under the Clean Air Act to substantially reduce pollution through the development of cutting edge technologies. Addressing carbon pollution under the Clean Air Act will not be any different. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify on this important subject, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, Ms. McCabe, thanks very much for being here, as I said, and thanks for your testimony. <clears throat> we'll now uh, uh, have questions for you, and uh, I'll recognize myself for five minutes for the first questions. Uh, first of all, uh, this legal term, adequately demonstrated, what, what is your definition of adequately demonstrated? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, the EPA, in uh, developing new source performance standards, which we have done many, many times under the Clean Air Act, uh, does a broad review of what technologies are um, available, feasible, um, in use, and, and uh, being developed. Um, indeed, that's one of the elements of Section 111 of the Clean Air Act, is that the new source performance standards, um, which apply to plants that are to be built in the future, um, are to encourage uh, new cutting edge and innovative technologies. So we look at the broad range of technologies that are out there. Um, and in this case, uh, we looked at the types of technologies that were be being used for uh, the newest um, uh, 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 generation of clean power plants that are being built, clean natural gas, and, and coal but you, technology. But you think the projects that you all have identified would adequately demonstrate that the technology is available? That is what our proposal lays out. Yeah. Now, even though uh, m my recollection is the federal government provided about $1.4 billion for those three projects that are all in enhanced oil recovery areas, and they're all cost overruns on them, and none of them are completed. Uh, so uh, how can you issue a regulation that would dramatically, dramatically change the possibility of even building a plant on such uh, speculative uh, processes? Well, um, uh, with respect, I, I, I wouldn't refer to these as speculative technologies. They, uh, carbon capture and sequestration uh, has been used in industrial applications for many years. Uh, but is it commercially project, available? It is commercially available. Where? There, and there where, are, where is the project? Well, there, there are uh, four projects underway. Two of them are uh, significantly... Uh, Have they been completed? They um, are uh, very close to completion, about three do, quarters Do you away. know when they'll be completed? Um, uh, my understanding is that the two that are um, under construction now are expected to begin operation in 2014. And where are they located? Um, uh, there's the, the Kemper uh, plant. Um, and all of them have government money uh, involved in them. And, well, we just have some fundamental disagreements on this, and, and that's why we have hearings. And... Uh, let me ask you this question. I've read repeatedly that uh, the carbon dioxide emissions in America are the lowest that they've been in 20 years, which I think speaks well of the Clean Air Act, speech, speaks well of the efforts that you all are making. But America, we don't have to take a back seat to any country in the world on the great progress that we have made in cleaning up the environment. So if you were at a Rotary Club and someone like asked me the question the other day, why is it that in America with the great success that we've had and, and the lowest emissions in 20 years, why are we unilaterally saying to ourselves that you can't build a new coal plant in America? Well, we're not saying you can't build a new coal plant in America. We're, in fact, providing a path. Well, er, 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 look, everybody we talk to in the business says, now I understand, let me just say, natural gas prices are very low, so no one's uh, interested in building a plant right now. But if they want it to, people tell us they would not do it because they cannot meet these uh, requirements. And so th that's one of the fundamental differences that we have is that, uh, w uh, just like I mentioned, in Europe, they're closing down 30 gigawatts of natural gas and they're going to coal. Why should we remove that option uh, here in America? We have a 250-year reserve of coal. It doesn't mean that they're going to be built immediately, but if the circumstances change, why, why shouldn't we be able to do it? Right now, we would not be able to do it. We agree absolutely that there needs to be a clear path for coal. Uh, coal is the largest source of energy in the country now. We expect it to continue to be. There are four projects underway 
uh, that are going forward that would use this technology. Um, so uh, the, the coal plants are moving forward. Have you ever had the meetings with the president? I mean, what, what did he mean? Have you ever heard him discuss when he made that comment, well, I'll bankrupt the coal industry? Have you ever heard a, had a discussion with him about that? I, I, I was not in discussions with okay. the president about that. You know, I'll make, make, make one other comment. In 1965, coal worldwide provided 93 percent of the electricity. 2013, coal provides 87 percent of the worldwide electricity. So it's quite obvious that while renewables are important, the base load is going to have to be fossil fuels. So, uh, well, thank you m very much, Ms. McCabe. I look forward to continuing our discussion and working with you on these issues. This time I recognize the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. McNerney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. McCabe, are there any coal-fired power plants in the U.S. that don't receive any sort of government money? Any coal plants in the country that don't receive any federal any money? Any kind of government money at all. Are there any in the country? I, I, I don't know th th that I know the answer to that question. Uh, uh, there are some coal plants that um, are uh, receiving government money, but I can't speak for every coal plant in the country. Well, I, I would say that um, it's a bit virtually impossible, given uh, what the legislation proposes, for uh, coal-fired power plants to use uh, CCS equipment uh, that aren't receiving some sort of government Subsidy. So I think the bill makes it impossible uh, for EPA to require that in the future. What I will say is that uh, the, the, the history has been that as new technologies are developed, they often receive uh, government subsidies, and, and that's an important role that government can play in encouraging uh, research and development uh, of new technologies that then become part of the mainstream. Well, thank you. Uh, the coal industry and critics of the EPA's efforts to control carbon pollution from power plants are saying that carbon capture and storage technology is not feasible. We keep hearing that it isn't ready and won't be for years, but that's contrary to the evidence. The coal industry was saying something very different just four years ago. Back in 2009, when the House passed an energy bill that would have set limits on carbon pollution and requiring CCS, the coal industry was running ads about how CCS was the future of coal. Let me show you an example. Here's a 2010 television ad from the Console Energy, one of the biggest coal companies in the country. The focus of my work is carbon dioxide capture and sequestration. We have coal-fired power plants today that are already capturing CO2. We can store carbon dioxide underground and do it in a safe way. The challenge now is finding ways to do this on a widespread scale and also to reduce the cost and improve the efficiency of the technology. I'm a member of a international collaboration, all working toward a common goal here, a coal-fired power plant with near zero emissions. In light of that ad, um, what do you think the outlook for carbon capture and sequestration storage technology is? Uh, based on the information that we reviewed and have laid out in our proposal, it's clear that carbon capture sequestration um, is, is, technology is available, is feasible. It has um, been uh, uh, used in applications for many years. Um, it is going forward um, with uh, uh, commercial um, scale coal plants. And uh, so we see that carbon capture and sequestration um, as being a, a future technology that will be um, very much in use. So was that ad correct in saying that the industry was using CCS technology four years ago? Um, the, there um, have been industry applications of CCS for many years. Well, is carbon capture and storage technology going to be widely deployed in the United States in the absence of a requirement to use it or other strong policy driver? The, the history of development of technologies um, in, in the power sector and in many other industrial sectors has been that um, uh, with the um, new source performance standards, which put in place requirements based on um, the, the clean and, and, uh, and, and forward-looking technologies that this country is so good at inventing, um, that those then um, al allow those technologies to become widespread, um, the cost to come down, and they become uh, routine examples and standard um, equipment in, in the future. 
Well, what is your response to the argument that we should just wait for years or even decades before limiting the amount of carbon pollution that power plants can emit? Well, as has already been uh, stated by um, uh, members of the committee, including yourself, uh, climate change is a, a serious health threat uh, to the citizens of this country and, and in fact, the world. Um, and uh, to delay the steps that we can take reasonably now um, would, uh, would increase the likelihood of, of, of significant um, health impacts um, and would be failing to do what we can do now uh, to uh, reduce carbon emissions. Well, thank you. If coal is going to have a long-term future, uh, carbon pollution from those plants must be reduced significantly, and carbon sequestration and uh, storage is the only technology we have that can do that. Is that right? Well, um, th the, th that is the key technology for coal-fired uh, uh, power plants at this time, is carbon capture and sequestration. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having this hearing and uh, appreciate uh, Senator Manchin being here earlier, as well as uh, you, Ms. McCabe, uh, coming here to testify. I think it's very clear that the Obama administration has a war on coal, and, and I think their objectives have been stated uh, over the years uh, in terms of what they're trying to achieve, and, and I think that is unachievable goals that are designed to ultimately bankrupt the coal industry. And we're seeing it across so many states uh, with, with job losses, uh, but, but also with increased energy costs. And, and, you know, when you talk about the impact on low-income families, uh, these high energy costs hit low-income families the hardest. Uh, and so when the administration puts these policies in place, uh, they're having real consequences negatively, not only on our economy, but on families. And so when we bring legislation like this in a bipartisan way, and again, I, I commend the chairman uh, for bringing this bill, but also the, the, the senator uh, as well, because it shows that there, there's bipartisan interest in, in, in ending this war on coal and getting back to an economy uh, that, that can function uh, using all of the available tools that we have, including coal, uh, that, that's, that's very low cost and very effective. And so when Senator Manchin says that under our bill, EPA will no longer be able to impose unachievable standards, uh, is there something about that that you disagree with? I mean, do you think y'all should be able to impose the unachievable standards you've been imposing so far? The, the standards that we have proposed and that are, are out for public comment now um, are achievable. They're uh, based on technologies that are available and feasible, um, uh, uh, based on um, uh, experience in, in the real world. And, um, uh, and well, I don't necessarily think they're in the real world. Can you get, and you mentioned four examples you said that, that, that y'all point to mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, coal-fired power plants that, that uh, that are adamantly, adequately demonstrated. What, what are those four examples? Um, uh, the first is the Kemper plant, um, uh, which is in Mississippi. Um, it's about 75% complete. It's an IGCC plant. We're uh, familiar with that. We've had them testify. Who, what are the other three? If you can um, run through those real uh, quickly. Uh, there's the, the Boundary Dam um, project in Saskatchewan. That's a 110 megawatt um, plant, uh, um, the pulverized coal plant, it's 75% complete. It's designed to capture 90%. Our next one. Um, the next one is the HECA plant in California, um, which is also designed to capture 90%. Uh, that's an IGCC plant as well. And the Texas Clean Energy Project, a 400 megawatt uh, plant, also designed to uh, capture 90%. Of, well, of the carbon. Well, let, let me go. Uh, first, let me start with the Kemper plant. You use the Kemper plant as, as one of your poster children for, mm -hmm. for how CCS works so well. It's, it's, uh, it's adequately demonstrated. Uh, we had the Kemper folks come and testify. Uh, let me read you some of the statements. Because uh, when, when you all in, in, in introduced and announced your new coal-fired power plant rules, the, the southern company that made that, making that plant said, quote, because the unique characteristics that make the project the right choice for Mississippi cannot be consistently replicated on a national level. The Kemper County Energy Facility should not serve as a primary basis for new emission standards impacting all new coal-fired plants. The people building the plant are saying this thing is it's creating a lot of problems for them to build it this way, but it's saying it surely should not be used as some kind of national model. And yet you're sitting here saying you're using it as a national model, but the people building it are saying it shouldn't be used as a national model. Do you, do you aware, first of all, are you aware that they've said that? Uh, yes, I am. 
Well, then why are you still using it as a national model? Well, with respect, uh, Congressman, uh, th there are three other plants that are going. Well, this was the first one you listed. So I'm going to start with this one. Kemper said, you know, the other three I don't think have testified. Kemper has testified. And their testimony was they shouldn't be used as a national standard, and yet you're sitting here using it as a national standard, and you know that they said they shouldn't be used as a standard. So why are you still using it? Well, um, Scratch them we, off your we, list. We, we, we don't um, uh, base our rules on the, uh, the thoughts and comments of one company. We you're saying, that was the first one you mentioned, mm -hmm. and you said you're using real-world examples. And the first real-world example that you used, they've testified saying that they shouldn't even be used as a standard. So I, you're not living in the real world. You're using an example where the people that you're citing have said they shouldn't be used as a national example because that doesn't replicate itself nationally. You should be talking about things that can actually be replicated in the real world for these standards to exist. Let me ask you this, because I know that the chairman brought this up. You know, we've all heard the statement. Yeah, I don't know if you have or not. The president, President Obama said, quote, so if somebody wants to build a coal-powered plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them. Do you agree with the president's statement that he made that they can build a plant, but it'll bankrupt them if they build it? Do you agree with that? The, the, and is that what y'all are trying to achieve with these rules? The, the clean, no. The, the Clean Air no? Act, over its history, has regulated uh, the power sector, including coal-fired power plants, and, and uh, uh, claims that it would uh, bring the, shut the lights off and skyrocket coal prices or power prices have been made before and have been demonstrated time and again not to be true. So and the president's because, claim is not true? Because the president made that claim. You'll back gentleman's up. time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Michigan, uh, Mr. Dingell, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for that, and I commend you for this hearing. I want to make it clear that I agree with my colleague, Mr. Whitfield, that we should do something to provide clarity on how to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. However, the bill before us creates a peculiar and entirely new process for regulations under the Clean Air Act. I'm afraid that this bill will take a long-established and reasonably effective regulatory process, turn it upside down to the great detriment of all of those in the industry and who are seeking certainty. Some questions for you, Ms. McCabe. First, I would like to have you answer a question I asked Administrator McCarty and Secretary Moniz at a recent hearing on climate change. Do you see a future for coal as a viable energy source in light of the impending greenhouse regulations? Please answer yes or no. Yes. Uh, now, this bill requires that no EPA rule applicable to existing coal-fired power plants may become effective unless and until the Congress acts to adopt a new law. Are you aware of any precedent for such provision in the Clean Air Act? Answer yes or no, if you please. No. Now, the traditional approach is that Congress passes a law that directs a federal agency to issue a regulation meeting specific criteria. Congress retains its control over the result by exercising good old-fashioned oversight. If we do not approve of the results and the agency is unresponsive to Congress's vigorous exercise of its proper oversight authority, Congress may then pass a new law to provide further direction to the agency. This bill would, as a practical matter, eliminate the delegation of rulemaking authority to EPA and set Congress up as a regulatory agency. Now, Ms. McCabe, in your view, would, oh, by the way, do you agree with that statement that the bill would, as a practical matter, eliminate delegation rulemaking authority to EPA? Yes. Now, Ms. McCabe, in your view, would the approach in this bill be effective and workable for regulating carbon pollution from power plants, yes or no? No. Now, I tend to agree with you since this bill proposes to change how EPA regulates greenhouse gas emissions without amending the Clean Air Act itself. It seems that the only ideas in this subcommittee uh, product before us is to block and indefinitely delay rules 
and propose rules without providing any alternative solutions on how to address the problem at hand. Do you agree with that statement? Yes. Now, uh, since becoming active administrative administrator, have you reached out to the stakeholders, including industry, about in all different parts of the industry, about components of the greenhouse gas rule, new and existing sources? Please yes, answer we yes or no. Yes, we have. Uh, would you submit for the record? Not, not at this time, but just submit for the record what you have done. Now, I've always believed that we should build a consensus to create s support for moving legislation forward. I once again offer to work with my colleagues on both sides to develop legislation dealing with greenhouse gas emissions that provides both clarity and certainty to industry and to regulators. Sometimes things are done in a certain way for a reason. Sometimes history and experience have something to teach us. I would urge my friends here to attend these, to these lessons and what we have learned from them before leaping to the conclusion that a simplistic change will make things better. All too often I find that the radical approach proposed in the Congress of late uh, will do nothing except create confusion and problems. And it is my fear that this bill is one of six proposals that's going to cause us a lot of future difficulties. I thank you for uh, recognizing me, Mr. Chairman. I yield you back 28 seconds. Thank you so much. I wish you'd yield me that time to respond to you. But uh, <laughs> at this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, uh, Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to let Mr. Okay. Shimkus go. Mr. Shimkus for uh, Illinois for five minutes. I thank my friend and, and welcome. It's very emotional, you know, and so we'll, uh, this is really the livelihood in a lot of our districts. So we, we have great concerns. First of all, just to, yeah, I hate to correct Mr. Dingo, or at least continue to set the record straight, but the Clean Air Act that he was involved with in the legislation, I, uh, there were amendments offered to make sure that carbon dioxide was not considered a criteria pollutant. And it was only through a court case and litigation, and then I would argue a failed ruling by the unendangerment finding by the EPA that we're even in this mess. So the, the process, how, how we got here, is not as clear as the ranking member, or Chairman Emeritus, sends to uh, portray in how legislation and regulation occurs. The second point, to my friend in California, we do have power plants that receive no government subsidies, coal-fired power plants. In fact, they pay local, state, federal taxes. They have high wages. They have great benefits. They have economic development for rural America. So if there's any thought that we got coal-fired power plants that are getting government subsidies, it's only to try to implement a CCS standard, which brings me to the question. The four CCS power plant projects that we've been talking about, and also in your EPA September 20th proposal, uh, support it, to support its claim that CCS for coal plants is adequately demonstrated, each are being built with hundreds of millions of dollars of government funding. Are any commercial scale CCS power plant projects going forward right now in the U.S. that aren't receiving government funding? Uh, the four that we have referred to are the four that are going forward. The, the question is, are there any commercial size, and that deals with the ad too, because that's not commercial size. Are there any commercial scale CCS power plant projects going forward right now in the U.S. that aren't receiving government funding? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but the ones that are going forward. The answer forward. is no, you are correct. Does EPA believe it is appropriate to rely on government subsidized demonstration projects to show that a technology is adequately demonstrated? With respect, Congressman, I would not call these demonstration projects. These are uh, commercial projects that are going forward, um, as has often. Okay, so the question is do you think that if it's a government funded project and then we're trying to see if it is commercially viable, do you think? government subsidizing a project equates to commercially viable? 
I do think that these plants are commercially viable. They intend to produce power and sell it. But commercially viable also talks about the cost and benefit and the capital investment and the risk assumed and the cost for selling the commodity product. So if the federal government is subsidizing that, how in the world can the federal government, an agency that's not in a market system, make b believe that they have the, the, the capital, capitalistic model that says, with 100 million plus of government subsidies, with, this is going to be a commercially viable project. How do you do that? Uh, it would be more like the Department of Commerce should probably have an evaluation than, than you all on the commercial viability. As technologies develop, government subsidies often help. Um, this is not the only circumstance. Do you think that every power plant now that's going to be built in the coal-fired power plant will need millions of dollars of government subsidies on carbon capture and sequestration? I, I do not think so. And what is the basis of that analysis? Uh, uh, experience and uh, information and analysis from uh, uh, from the Department of Energy and other agencies on our the Kemper, over time. The Kemper facility is how much millions of dollars over budget? I, I don't know. How, how long uh, over? It's, it's about $2 billion over budget. And how long, is the, how long has it been delayed because of this? See, you see our problem? Two things. You're saying the technology is available. We're saying it's not. We're running ads on, on demonstration projects that are small scale, and we're talking about large scale power plants, anywhere from 800 to, I've got a new power plant, 1,600 megawatts. Be, to be able to capture carbon and, and put it in long-term geological uh, storage on small, small scale, yeah, we can do that in, in advanced oil recovery. We can't do it in large scale. And the, the, the administration's, um, gaming the system to say that because we have government subsidized uh, power plants at millions of dollars that is commercially viable is, is fraudulent and is very disappointing. I yield back my time. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from uh, California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since 1970, when uh, President Nixon signed the Clean Air Act, uh, we've had a law that had several key features that have helped make it one of the most successful environmental laws in the world. Science-based, health protective standards keep our eyes on the prize. Healthy air for everyone. Cooperative federalism allows the EPA to set the clean air goals and then the states decide how best to achieve them. And the Clean Air Act uses regulatory standards to drive technological innovation in pollution controls, often called technology forcing standards. The act recognizes that it usually costs less to dump pollution for free than to clean it up. So businesses generally don't control pollution absent regulatory requirements. Ms. McCabe, could you give us some examples of how Clean Air Act standards have driven air pollution control technologies? Certainly, Mr. Waxman. Um, there are a couple of uh, very appropriate examples that affect the, pa the power sector particularly. Um, the first is the, the use of scrubbers. Um, so uh, when, uh, when the uh, new source performance standards, which is the same rule we're talking about here, uh, were developed uh, to require the use of scrubbers, they were not in widespread use. There were only a couple, in fact, um, out there. And uh, since that time, they have now become mainstream standard equipment on, on any new power Power plants. And those scrubbers have gotten better, haven't they? They have gotten better. They've gotten and cheaper. And they've and they've gotten cheaper. And they have um, brought improved public health to millions of Americans by reducing SO2 um, substantially. So we we know um, from decades of experience that the Clean Air Act drives innovations in pollution control. You mentioned scrubbers, but I know that there are others we can talk about as yes, well. Uh, it uh, it drives innovation pollution controls, and then that becomes the industry standard. Uh, there's something else we've learned over the past 40 years. Almost every time EPA proposes a significant new requirement, industry tells us it can't be done. And I've been around all of these decades, and I've heard it over and over again. It'll cost too much. It'll destroy our economy. 
it will turn off the lights. Uh, I want to show you, uh, I don't know if we have it on the screen. Oh, I'm not going to show you, but I'm going to tell you about it. An ad that the American Electric Power System ran in 1974, the year I was elected. And they opposed requirements for scrubbers to clean up sulfur dioxide. And it describes scrubbers as monstrous contraptions that clog the works and cause prolonged shutdowns and would produce, quote, a disposal nightmare, end quote. Is that what happened? Not at all. EPA proposed a requirement that we have these scrubbers, and you just mentioned it. They're, they're now ubiquitous. They're the standard. They're cheaper. They're more effective. What did industry say when EPA proposed to require selective catalytic reduction to clean up nitrogen oxides or activated carbon injection to control mercury? And how did those statements compare with what actually happened? Those are similar examples where there were widespread concerns that it was going to be um, uh, very detrimental to the coal industry, and that has turned out not to be the case. In fact, industry has found cheaper and, and um, uh, very reliable ways to control those pollutants. So once an air pollution standard is in place, American industry gets to work and, in, and meets it. And along the way, we develop more effective and less expensive pollution control technologies, not only is our air cleaner, but we also export tens of billions of dollars of pollution control equipment all over the world. And we've seen that happen over and over again. But the Whitfield bill would eliminate EPA's ability to drive pollution control technology, rejecting an approach that has been successful for over four decades. If this bill had been in effect in 1971, EPA could not have issued standards based on scrubber technology. Only two power plants, as you mentioned, had operating scrubbers at the time. The 1971 rule was finalized. And if this bill were adopted now, EPA likely could never set a standard based on carbon capture and sequestration. This bill is a radical rewrite of the Clean Air Act that would block any real reductions in carbon pollution from coal plants, and it ignores 40 years of experience. I want to point out a couple things. There are criteria pollutants spelled out in the Clean Air Act, but the Clean Air Act requires EPA to deal with other pollutants as well. And that's not just this one, carbon, but others that are already being regulated. And to say that there's no subsidy for a power plant that spews uh, pollution and hurts the, the public health and causes a great deal of damage like we're seeing with climate change, that's a subsidy because they don't have to pay for controlling their pollution. We all have to pay in more harm to the climate, more harm to the uh, planet, and more harm to our environment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I don't think it, it's news to the committee, but uh, I am a co-sponsor of your legislation, and I hope we'll move to uh, thank you very much move move towards uh hearing and uh, hopefully um a markup we're glad to have you uh, we're always glad to have our friends from epa um could you tell the subcommittee to the best of your knowledge are co2 emissions in the united states up or down um, well that's a relative question um congressman uh, co2 emissions are significant um, uh, from uh, and I didn't activities. ask the significance of them. I said, are they going up or are they going down? It, it depends on where you start. Um, so well, let's they, start from going, five years ago. They've been going up significantly over time. Uh, in the most recent years, uh, there has been a reduction in emissions. So they are going down. There has been a recent reduction, uh, but over time, carbon they, emissions they are going down. Are significant. You know that, and I know that. Which country is number one right now in CO2 emissions, the United States or China? Um, I believe it's China. You believe correctly. Could you tell me what the cost is per megawatt uh, to build a new coal-fired plant under existing regulations as compared 
to a, a, a combined cycle natural gas plant, which is most cost effective right now under current regulations? The, um, uh, I'm sorry, I want to make sure I understand your question. Um, I'm comparing a, a uh, uh, state of the art mm -hmm. natural gas fired power plant that's being built today uh, compared to a coal fired power plant that could be built today under existing regulations. Which would be which is the most cost effective per megawatt of output? Um, uh, I believe, Congressman, and um, if, if if I need to uh, supplement, I certainly will. But uh, given the, um, uh, the the fuel prices today, um, that the um, the industry is building uh, natural gas fired plants because they are they are more, more cost more, effective. More cost effective. Yeah, more cost. You get more output and less input, and the uh, CO2 emissions are approximately half that of a coal-fired plant. Could you tell t today what the cost of construction of a coal-fired power plant is um, today? Do you know that number? I, I don't know that number, Congressman. Could, do you know what percent of the cost of a coal-fired power plant uh, is, is directed towards emission control? I, I don't have that number with me. It's approximately two-thirds. Two-thirds of the cost of a new coal-fired power plant is for emission control, and i.e., it, it's not for efficiency, it's not for power generations, it's simply to control uh, emissions as a consequence of, of burning coal. If we were to implement the proposed regulations uh, that would require carbon capture and sequestration, do you know what percentage of the total cost those emissions control would be? Uh, I, I don't have that number. Um, th there would, would, be would you agree with me that it's you're basically going to spend approximately three times the cost of the power plant itself to control the emissions and, and capture and sequester the carbon? I, I don't know that to be the case. Tom. Okay. Could you get us the numbers and provide? Absolutely. I may be off, but I'm not off orders of magnitude. I mean, I may be off a little bit, but if we adopt, if, if the country adopts these proposed regulations, you're going to, if you want to build a, you know, anybody that would be crazy enough to try to build a coal-fired power plant, would you'd be you'd basically be paying three to four times for the emission control what you're paying to generate the power. What, what I can say, Congressman, is based on the economic analysis that is laid out in our proposed rule, uh, the cost of uh, building a uh, coal-fired power plant under the proposed standards is in line with other non-natural gas power generation, biomass, nuclear, <laughs> and such. Well, since they're non-competitive, that, that might be a true statement, yeah. Um, finally, my time's expired. Could you give the committee a, a summary of all CO2 poisoning incidents in the last five years here in the United States? Uh, it's going to be a short piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 we, we are concerned about carbon because of its effects in the atmosphere and on the climate, which are well demonstrated. So you, you accept that, that nobody has been poisoned as a result of inhalation or exposure to CO2 in the United States, ever? CO2 does not, does not work in that way, but it creates damage to public health without doubt. That's a debatable proposition. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Yarmouth. Now, I think at our last uh, subcommittee hearing, we recognized that he was a new member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and Mr. McNerney and I were talking, and he said, I don't think we introduced him, and I thought we did, but Mr. McNerney, would you like to make some comments? Well, no, I, I appreciate that opportunity. Um, Mr. Yarmouth is a close friend of mine from Kentucky, so he's uh, well connected to these issues, but uh, coming from a, a, a journalistic background, he has a lot of insight into how to proceed and, and uh, question witnesses and 
So I really think he's going to be a tremendous addition to our committee and our subcommittee. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, since Mr. Tonko actually was here before Mr. Yarmouth, <laughs> you, you all now know Mr. Yarmouth, but we're going to recognize Mr. Tonko in New York for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry, Mr. Yarmouth. <laughs> okay. Um, Administrator McCabe, welcome. Uh, the motivation for this legislation and the direction of the questions today suggests there's considerable skepticism about carbon uh, capture and sequestration technologies. I strongly support moving forward to address carbon pollution, and I do not believe we can leave the utility sector out of that effort. While I believe carbon capture technologies are technically feasible, I'm not as confident about our ability to sequester the carbon dioxide that is captured. We may need to build new plants in areas that are not close to a storage reservoir. In light of that, I have a few questions. Other than using the captured carbon dioxide for enhanced oil recovery, are there other options for sequestering carbon that are being considered? Uh, well, we know that it is possible to sequester uh, carbon, even uh, not w for enhanced oil recovery. Um, the, the EPA has uh, regulations in effect now that provide guidance for people on how to do that. So it, it, it is doable. Okay, thank you. And are there any opportunities being explored uh, to use biomass as the final sequestration reservoir for carbon? Um, I, 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 I don't know, Congressman, but we'd happily follow up on that question. Thank you. Is there any opportunity for gaining further efficiencies in operation of a new coal-fired utility or integrating renewable generation, or CHP for that matter, with coal-fired generation that would enable a facility to meet the standard without having to capture and sequester all the carbon dioxide that's generated? Well, I should clarify that the proposed rule does not require that all the carbon be captured. It's based on um, a partial carbon capture, um, about 30 to 50 percent, um, which is, and this is all laid out in our proposal, um, is uh, the point at which um, uh, meaningful um, reductions of carbon uh, can occur at a, at a, at a reasonable cost. Um, there are other uh, technologies and approaches that uh, the power sector can use to, to um, uh, uh, reduce uh, carbon, and you've named some of them. And that integration, you think, is feasible with other generation or CHP? Uh, I believe so. It seems to me we are focusing too much on what cannot be done and not investing sufficient research dollars in solving the problems. Are we investing enough in research? Um, I, um, hard for me to answer that, uh, Congressman. I, I, I think that there is a lot of work being done to explore a variety of ways to produce power in a, in a clean way. Um, in addition, th there are many companies that are on the, the forward edge of, of their industry trying to find ways to, to reduce uh, harmful pollution, including carbon. Um, and there are, is, is a, a government interest and academic interest in helping to further those technologies. Well, it's a trillion-dollar industry, and a couple billions of research just may not cut it. I would also observe that we rarely have a technology ready to go to solve a problem if there's no certain market for that technology. Is it the administration's view that regulatory certainty will move technology development forward more rapidly? Uh, that has been the the the, um, the 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 history of the Clean Air Act um, in uh, developing standards for. Uh, for new plants of any sort, uh, all sorts of industries, uh, that uh, putting those regulations in place um, uh, p provides a path for the industry and those technologies then become standard. Well, I assume EPA is working closely with DOE uh, on this uh, effort. And while DOE is not here today, I hope we will have an opportunity to hear from that agency on this topic also. And finally, I would ask, um, in terms of the um, instant uh, legislation that we're reviewing here today. Does that move us closer toward research uh, at a time when we need that research? It seems to me it's pulling us away from research. It's not focusing on the, uh, the element of that research. Well, the, the, the bill, as I understand it, would uh, require um, uh, um, the, uh, and would 
taken a different approach to determining um, how to set a standard for future power plants um, that would not provide the path for innovation and, um, and moving new technologies into the market. Yeah. Well, it seems we're in a phase of activity here where R&D is absolutely a compelling factor in order for us to transition, transform an arena that is essential to the growth of this country and its economy. So I thank you for your responses today, and it's great to have the agency represented here. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Gentleman yields back. This time, recognize the gentleman from uh, Nebraska, Mr. Terry. Thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman, and uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, I want to follow up on a white paper that was signed by 17 attorney generals, including ours from Nebraska. The white paper was sent to the EPA, uh, as I said, by 17 attorney generals. And it states that the, uh, quote, uh, the elimination of coal as a fuel for new electric generation would have highly concerning implications for electricity prices and for our, the economy and job creation in general, as well as the competitiveness of American manufacturing. I happen to agree with the Attorney General's statement on this, particularly in Nebraska, where we are a coal-heavy reliant state and very close to the Powder River Basin, and uh, so it makes us have, uh, it allows us to have very affordable and reliable electricity generation in our state. So I want to know, uh, does the EPA maintain that it has legal authority to eliminate coal as a fuel for new electric generation? The proposed rule would not eliminate coal for new electric generation. In fact, just the opposite. The proposal would provide a clear regulatory path um, to, that coal plants um, could follow. Okay. Now, um, I understand that answer, and some would say that uh, the regulatory issues uh, would, in essence, uh, prevent the way that they will be expected to be written and implemented would make it very difficult and expensive uh, to use coal. Now, the Attorney Generals also raised concerns that the EPA will not properly defer to the states in establishing or implementing standards for existing power plants, and that under the guise of quote-unquote flexibility, the EPA will require existing plants to operate less or shut down. Can you provide assurances to the Attorney Generals that in its uh, GHG regulation of existing plants, EPA will not force the retirement or reduction of operation of still viable coal-fired plants? So, Congressman, now you're shifting to uh, the, the existing the yeah, power exactly. plant proposal, which of, which, of course, is not in, at a proposal stage yet. It's at the very early stages of discussion and, um, and, uh, and, and exploration. Um, and that, um, uh, the, the, the Clean Air Act provision for existing facilities operates in a very different way from the provision for setting new source performance standards. Um, it does... Uh, re require the EPA to set uh, guidelines and then relies on the states uh, to develop plans to achieve those guidelines in their states. This is the, 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 the um, um, uh, very um, uh, successful um, and fundamental uh, provision that underlies the Clean Air Act of the federal state partnership when it comes to especially existing sources that states are in the best position to figure out how best to comply uh, with, with an environmental targets. So, so that well, is, uh, the, those are the discussions we are having now and will be having. Um, and uh, the, the um, ultimate outcome and what's expected of the existing fleet is, uh, will be very different from uh, what uh, is expected in a new source performance standard and, and as Administrator McCarthy has said, um, th there is no expectation that, that carbon capture and sequestration would be a technology that would be appropriate for existing plants. Okay. But in discussions from some of our more rural coal-fired plant operations, they fear that the standards for reduction of CO2, uh, that will be extremely costly to meet, and therefore their only options that's the quotations around flexibility, is to reduce their operations. Now, if you're receiving feedback from states like Nebraska, where we do have older 
uh, coal-fired plants that are going to be significantly impacted by this rule? We're having lots of discussions with states all around the country, um, including Nebraska and, and others, um, and we are uh, discussing the differences between the new source standard and the existing standards. Um, and it is, it is not our expectation that the existing standards, which of course will go through a robust uh, public comment period um, a, a, as well, um, will uh, require um, the, uh, so, for example, who would you be communicating with or receiving input pr at this early stage from Nebraska? Is it from the power plants? Is it for operators, uh, the companies? Um, uh, the, our, through our Region 7 office, um, there have been discussions both with um, state officials um, and I believe also with um, uh, and power, the power sector representatives as well as other stakeholders. Okay, thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired. This time, recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Caps, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, and thank you for your testimony, Administrator McCabe. We've heard from my friends across the aisle and from Senator Manchin about the cost of implementing carbon emission standards, but we've not heard anything yet from them about the much higher cost of climate change caused by the emissions that we're already paying for. We're seeing more extreme storms coastal erosion, and droughts across this country, not to mention the broader impacts of things like ocean acidification and the increased public health risks. Um, Ms. McCabe, will you elaborate a bit on this, please? What are some of the costs we're already paying for because of these unchecked emissions, and what are some that we will be paying for down the road if we don't take action now? Thank you for your question. Um, as you noted, there are significant impacts already being felt across the country and indeed ac across the globe um, as a result of the changing climate. Um, you mentioned some of them. Um, in this country, we have seen um, uh, 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 increased wildfires um, in both the frequency and, and uh, uh, severity um, that uh, cost um, in terms of property damage, in danger to, um, uh, to human health, um, and indeed sometimes to, to human life. Um, in addition, storms like Hurricane Sandy um, are uh, tremendously costly, uh, uh, devastating to those communities yes. um, in, in terms of uh, the, the, the property damage, the, uh, the health impacts, um, which uh, uh, last far beyond the actual Ab event absolutely. of the storm. Thank um, you. I'll, I'll move on because sure. I know you could go on and on on that topic. Given that power plants are the number one source of carbon pollution, do you see any way to reduce these costs, the kind that you're talking about, without first reducing carbon emissions? Uh, carbon is simple. Car carbon emissions need to be reduced. Yes. Now, we all know the cost and viability of carbon captured sequestration technology has been at the core of this debate. But again, my friends across the aisle have been focusing on the cost, but all at the same time ignoring the benefits of using this technology. Whether it's jobs developing better CCS systems, jobs installing the systems, or jobs in related industries that purchase the captured CO2, which is a whole other industry, there are some benefits, right, to CCS that cannot, should not be ignored. Now, uh, Ms. McCabe, did EPA compare the costs and benefits of implementing CCS in its analysis? If so, can you briefly discuss those findings? Um, in, in our proposal, we have a, um, an economic analysis that, that uh, lays out all these issues and uh, uh, looks at the expected uh, costs of the technologies for the um, various for gas and coal plants. Um, so all that information is laid out. Thank you, and that's something that is available to the public Absolutely. so that we can see that there is a payoff uh, in economic de development for doing this. And a final question. Uh, we hear frequently that power companies would be eagerly building new p coal plants if only it weren't for the uncertainty created by EPA and these carbon emission regulations. Setting aside the fact that cheap natural gas has, has really been the primary reason behind the recent decline in coal, which I did hear mentioned uh, uh, in this debate or this hearing, I do want to focus on this uncertainty issue. Mm -hmm. To me, if there's one thing for certain in this debate, it's that carbon emissions must and will be regulated. It's just a matter of how and when. I mean, we regulate everything, don't we? Um, EPA's authority to regulate carbon emissions from power plants has been upheld twice by the 
uh, United States Supreme Court. And President Obama has made it very clear that these power plant rules are a top priority for his administration. I see this discussion draft and other efforts to, de to derail the admission standards as simply delaying the inevitable. Um, so I'm going to ask if you think this proposed legislation would in decrease or increase uncertainty uh, regarding the regulation of carbon emissions. Industry tells me all the time that what they want is certainty. Um, so I'd like to have your uh, comments on this. I, I hear that also, uh, Congresswoman, and I've heard that over the years from industry, that they want regulatory certainty so that they can plan their investments and, and know what they should be building. And uh, this uh, proposal that we're going forward with would provide that um, a, 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 as opposed to a, a, d a delay and further uncertainty. Right. And, and don't you feel that the, that the, the uh, industries do recognize that they will be facing, if not sooner, later, uh, some re some more regulation as they develop newer and newer technologies. Th that is what we have heard from many industries. Thank you very much for your testimony. Gentlelady's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Administrator, for being with us today. Greatly appreciate uh, your testimony today. And uh, just to give you a little background about my my neck of the woods. Ohio gets 78 percent of its overall electricity comes from coal-fired plants. And up in my area of northwest Ohio, it's even greater than that. According to the national manufacturers, I have 60,000 manufacturing jobs in my district, which is the third largest number of manufacturing jobs on this committee. I also represent the largest number of farmers. And so what it really comes down to is what you're hearing is that we need energy and we need very competitive energy to be able to compete. And we're able to compete out there as long as we can have those things happening. But if all of a sudden our energy costs start going up, we're in trouble. And I also I'm blessed because I, not only do I have your, you know, your traditional large energy companies that uh, are in my uh, uh, state and across my district, but I also have electric co-ops, which I also have the largest number in the state of Ohio in a congressional district. And I also represent a large number of municipals, utilities. And I also go through a lot of businesses. And I've gone through over 400 plus businesses over about a 14 month period. And the number one thing I, I've always heard from everybody out there, it's on regulatory issues is the number one concern, but it's also about the EPA. And when we're talking about the EPA, I've never heard any business out there ever tell me that they're not for clean air or for clean water. But they're very concerned because one of the issues, again, that concerns them is, is that they have got to be able to comp be competitive. And, you know, when I look at the proposed uh, uh, bill, especially in Section 3, one of the issues that it comes down to, it says that uh, what you would be looking at with the EPA would be the you have to study the economic impacts of such rule guidelines that affect the potential economic growth, competitiveness, and jobs on the electric rate payers out there. So, again, that's what concerns the people in my district and, across, and really in the manufacturing side. And if I could just ask a few questions real quickly. The, uh, the first is, that, you know, when you're talking about the EPA conducting listening sessions relating to planned regulations for existing power plants, the EPA has really uh, avoided states like Ohio that, re again, rely heavily on coal-fired generation. Can the EPA provide any assurance that it will defer to states to set the standards of performance for existing electric generating units in their states? What, what I can tell you, Congressman, is that the way that this section of the Clean Air Act works is that uh, EPA establishes guidelines, um, and then the states develop plans to implement them. And, and that's a, a familiar approach in the Clean Air Act. Um, and so uh, our, um, very much our intent is to uh, work with states so that they have the flexibility to do that. And that's what a lot of these uh, initial interactions we're having with the states are all about, is to make sure that we know what is going on currently in the states, what, what they are looking forward to in their own energy policies, so that we can make sure that we uh, design a guideline that can accommodate that kind of flexibility. Well, and that, it's very, very important that that happens because, again, if you don't hear what's happening in these businesses out there, we're not going to have those folks out there uh, that are going to be able to provide these jobs. And also, can the EPA provide the assurance to the ratepayers in these states that the electricity rates will not go up as a result of the EPA regulations? 
You know, we've, we've seen over time uh, that uh, pollution uh, control technology has been able to advance in this country in the power sector um, while keeping energy costs low, and that is a very important consideration for the administration as we move well, and, forward. And again, as, uh, because I, I am, I'm out talking to these businesses uh, every week, and again, their number one issue is we've got to stay competitive and we want to see these jobs going someplace else because uh, they want to make sure that they you know, have uh, jobs for their community. And also, again, because when you look how unique, like Ohio is in the Midwest and Indiana, right next door, and I represent, re represent a district that runs right down the Indiana line, that, that when you look how much energy that they get from coal in Indiana, that will the EPA thoroughly look at the regional and local electricity rate impacts on these regulations? Um, we, we will look at those sorts of things, and we recognize that different states are in different positions. They have different energy mixes, different fuels. Um, different uh, energy needs, and, uh, and all of that uh, can be looked at in the development of um, a, a state-specific plan. And uh, finally, uh, some of the discussion that was uh, occurring about, uh, especially with Mr. Barton earlier, could you provide the, the committee with a list of the facilities that were using uh, scrubbers when the, when the standard was implemented and made final in the late 1970s? On sure. The we, well, we get a list of those companies. We appreciate that. We'll follow up with that. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. This time I'll recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Yarmouth, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate the welcome again, and uh, thank you, Mr. McNerney, for your kind comments. Uh, Ms. McCabe, welcome. Uh, there was discussion earlier about the, whether Congress intended originally in the Clean Air Act to regulate carbon emissions and um, then the comment made that a court basically said, ruled that it did. Uh, regardless of how it, we came to this point, the state of the law is that not only does EPA have the authority to regulate carbon emissions, it has the requirement to regulate carbon emissions. Isn't that correct? Uh, that's correct. And this bill, uh, if I'm correct, does not change that requirement. Anyway, you're still required to, even if this bill were to pass, you could still you still have to re regulate carbon emissions. As I understand it. <clears throat> so what this bill basically does is just eliminate one of the tools that you might have to regulate carbon emissions to meet the requirement that you have under the law. It would, it would significantly change the approach that we would, the traditional approach that we have taken right. under the Act. And we know there was another approach to doing this, and, and Mr. Waxman mentioned it in his testimony, and I want to go back to 2009 for a minute because uh, when we were debating uh, Waxman Markey at that time, uh, this was a very hard issue for me and the other members of the delegation from Kentucky. <clears throat> so we, uh, at least we Democrats, then Ben Chandler and I and uh, Baron Hill from Indiana and others worked with uh, Representative Boucher from Virginia to kind of construct a methodology that would have minimal impact or at least negative impact on Kentucky, which generates about 92 percent of its power through coal, and same in my district in Louisville. <clears throat> and after we had, had, had done that work and came up with a final product, before I cast my vote, I talked to all of the big users of energy in my district. I talked to uh, General Electric, which has a big manufacturing plant, Ford Motor, which has two plants. I uh, talked to uh, UPS, where we have the global hub, air hub. I talked to the metro government. I talked to the University of Louisville, the public school system. Uh, every one of those large users of energy said they were either for or neutral on the bill. They didn't think any of them, any, any of them none of them thought that it would impact them uh, negatively. And then I talked to the utility company, which powers virtually everybody in my district, and they said they thought the impact on residential customers would be over ten, after 10 years would be $15 a month additional cost if they did absolutely nothing. Uh, didn't insulate, didn't change light bulbs, didn't make any changes on the thermostat. So at that point, we were faced with the option of saying, All right, this looks like it can work, it can actually deal with carbon emissions in a way that doesn't impact coal, uh, states that are heavily dependent on coal generated power. The option is to turn it back to EPA to issue guidelines which may or may not be particularly sensitive to a state like Kentucky or a state like Indiana or a state like Ohio. And I thought that was a good vote. 
And we did, even though House Republicans opposed it, we did pass it in the House. It died in the Senate. So my question is, um, is that, would that kind of methodology still be an effective way to deal with carbon emissions? And if we had enacted Waxman-Markey in 2009, would, be, would we be here today? Well, the, the, the President has indicated um, uh, uh, over a, a number of years that legislation is a, would be an appropriate way to, to deal with this situation, um, but that's not where we are today, and so um, we, we are using the, the tried and true mechanisms of the Clean Air Act to uh, achieve the carbon reductions that are necessary. And to your knowledge, has there been any proposal made by anybody in the, re in the majority party to deal with carbon emissions in any way? Um, I, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I'm, I'm not aware of any. Right. Well, thank you very much for your testimony and your work. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair. Again, welcome, Administrator McCabe. This is not news, but America is on course to resume its role as the world's energy an economic powerhouse in the 21st century. There's no better example of that than the Port of Corpus Christi in my home state. A few months ago, for the first time ever, they exported more oil than they imported. Making this opportunity a reality requires common sense rules and no overregulation. Your new power plant rule will require carbon capture and sequestration. The CCS projects, pilot projects, are all near oil country. Captured carbon is sold, captured, pumped down, and used to jumpstart old wells. EOR is critical to viable CCS. And you recognize that. A quote from your new plant rules impact analysis. The opportunity to sell the captured CO2 for EOR rather than paying directly for its long-term storage, strongly improves the overall economics. So let's discuss EOR. Coal is critical for power supply in the eastern part of our country. Do you know, do you know how many states east of the Mississippi have a single CO2 pipeline? Any idea what number? No, I don't know. The answer is two. There's one in Mississippi, and a small one on the Michigan-Canadian border. The one in Mississippi is linked to the Hastings Field in my district. It's run by a company called Denbury. I visited their operations a few months ago. They spent $2 billion on their development for the Hastings Field. But they also own the Jackson Dome area in Mississippi which naturally produces CO2. And there's a power plant in my district as well that captures CO2 emissions from coal-fired power plants and uses them for EOR operations right there over an existing oil field. Mm -hmm. My point is, is that CCS EOR will only work because of geography and luck. My question is, if a utility decides to build a coal plant, they want to use a quote from your impact analysis to strongly improve the overall economics of CCS. That means they'll need a new pipeline. Is it reasonable to expect utilities to successfully site, permit, finance, and build an entire new network of CO2 pipelines? Is that even possible for more than a few test plants? Well. I as you've, as you've noted, um, EOR is a, a, a very important use of um, uh, captured CO2, um, does uh, help with the economics of, of a plant, but that is, is not to say that, that carbon storage is, is not feasible in other um, places, um, and uh, we expect that those types of projects um, to develop um, and, and, and be viable um, as the coal plants of the future are built. But right now they're not viable without, without EOR. And that's my point. We have to have some re mechanism to get these, this carbon dioxide to these power plants. That doesn't exist except for special circumstances, geography, and uh, with, the, uh, with the, the guys at the Denbury people owning 
and naturally producing CO2 structure. My final question is about reliability. And uh, EPA says that the new plant rule won't impact electric reliability. However, the EPA says one benefit is that, and this is a quote, the proposed rule will also serve as a necessary predicate for the regulation of existing sources. We don't know exactly what the new existing plant rule will look like, but if past actions of the Obama administration reflect the future, there will be a new burdens put upon coal. My home state is in desperate need of more power, and reliability is one of my top concerns. Can you guarantee that a carbon dioxide rule on existing coal plants will put grid reliability first? You're asking about the existing rule? The existing rule, the any rule. The, the, for, for existing power plants? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I, I can assure you, Congressman, that uh, in, in looking at uh, the, um, what the guidelines would be for existing power plants, we would have grid reliability, uh, cost, and, and those considerations very much in our minds as, as we go forward. And uh, as I've noted, uh, the implementation of those guidelines is, uh, is something that the states will be involved with, and it will be very much on their minds as well. But first, number one, everything else below, below I mean, because it's important, ma'am. We have to have power to keep growing. It, it, it is absolutely important, and we don't disagree. Thank you. Gentlemen, my time. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would have to say that many of the things my colleagues have said uh, I agree with and uh, do have um, many concerns, uh, particularly in light of the fact that uh, we did hear earlier uh, from the folks who run the Mississippi plant that that's not a practical plan anywhere else and that it costs them a, a billion dollars more than they thought it was and only works because they're right next to the fuel source, which is not your typical coal in the United States. Switching gears, as established in statute and practice, the term stationary source has a specific meaning under Section 111 of the Clean Air Act. Is the EPA considering or planning to redefine what stationary source means for the purposes of its pending rulemaking activity on existing electric generating units. And here's my concern. There's some who would believe or have us think that it ought to be the whole state. So if I've got a plant, which we do, that was just opened last year in my end of Virginia, and it's doing fine, but the rest of the state isn't, that the new regs may be placed, instead of looking at each individual plant, that the EPA may be looking at changing its rule and going with every state, and then all of a sudden new regs get put on my clean plant in order to try to help the plants that aren't as clean in other parts of the state. Is the EPA looking at changing any of those rules in regard to the uh, stationary source? Uh, we're not looking at changing the definition of stationary source, but um, what, what we will be doing through the 111D, which is the existing source mm -hmm. program, is um, allowing the states the flexibility to uh, look at, uh, at how to meet a target, uh, looking across um, all of the, the, the plants which, uh, and, and, and other activities in the state, which, which means that, that new clean plants um, are a benefit to the states because they're already making progress towards reducing carbon emissions. But if you have some plants that are cleaner than others, and, and the worry that I have is, is that oftentimes in the past the EPA has said, well, we're going to let the state do this, and then the EPA behind the scenes, and this happened on stormwater management in Virginia, says, you're going to adopt these regs, you're going to do this, or else we're going to come in and take it away from you, and we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, that was actual testimony in front of a committee I used to sit on when I was in the state legislature. So I'm a little concerned that if, if you're going to let the states go and look at a statewide project, maybe it's not my new clean plant, but it's one that's a little bit newer than some of the others, and you're, is there going to be pressure put on the states to then say, okay, we don't care if you have one bad actor or two bad actors. We, you've got to ratchet it up on everybody in order to meet certain standards. Yeah. Well, we, we, in the Clean Air Act, which is what I'm familiar with, um, uh, we have a long history of working with states developing plans to implement the federal standards, and, and there's, um, there's certainly room in the process for states to be looking at what makes the most sense for their states. Well, and I, I, I would like to think that we could figure out what makes the most sense, but that's not been my experience in the past with some of the regulations. 
In context of uh, 111D and regulations for existing uh, power plants, the EPA frequently refers to the term flexibility. I've not often found that to be the case, and, and not with you, ma'am, but, but with others. Um, does this mean flexibility in setting the standards or in implementing the standards? In implementing the standards. It's EPA's role to set the guideline, the, the target. But if flexibility is good, shouldn't it be good for also uh, not only for implementing but also for setting the standards to make sure that we're not putting people out of business or, as you testified a few minutes ago, making sure that we have grid reliability? Shouldn't that flexibility be there on both ends of that equation? Well, the, the, the Clean Air Act's approach um, over the last 40 years has been for the federal government to set the expected environmental result um, and then for the states to, to um, find flexible and, and appropriate ways to meet those. And, and, and that is the, uh, the way that Congress set out those um, provisions. And Congress did give, uh, I would think, way too much flexibility to the EPA, but that's a, an opinion of mine. Uh, in regard to the Whitfield Mansion Bill, uh, it seems to me that it's uh, reasonable to set standards based on actual uh, demonstrable technology. You would agree with that, would you not? Um, at the Clean Air Act already asks us uh, to set standards based so on... I'm running out of time. I need a yes or no. But you would agree that, that actual technology as opposed to theorized technology would be preferable. You, would you not? Yes or no? Uh, actual technology is what we base our rules on. All right. And would you also agree with me that there are high efficiency designs for new coal power plants such as the supercritical and ultracritical steam units? Yes or no? Yes, and those are appropriate technologies, certainly. And the Whitfield Mansion draft legislation simply requires that for new electric uh, generating units, EPA standards be based on technologies that have been demonstrated at operating commercial power plants, and that's certainly reasonable, isn't it? Uh, Th that would not be the approach of the, of the Clean Air Act um, that has been proven over the years to work uh, effectively in uh, developing so is that a yes technology. Or no? I, I, I would not agree. All right. Yep. <laughs> gentleman's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've got five questions at least, or if not more, but we'll try to see if we get through some quickly with it. The, the first is, I'm just curious, uh, in, the, in some of the opening earlier statements have been about um, that this is commercially viable now, mm -hmm. um, because I'm curious. Uh, Lisa Jackson said back in November of 2011 that it wouldn't be available for, and her quote was, maybe a decade or more. Um, so I'm curious how that's moved up on the chain and and DOE put out their own report that said it's not going to be commercially viable until 2020 uh, as well but you're saying it's available now uh, so rather, could, rather without the time uh, could you get back to me explaining why both of you disagree with Lisa Jackson and why you disagree with the Department of Energy uh, that their projection that it could be available could you get back in writing to me rather than answer now certainly thank, thank you Second is, I want to probe a little further about you saying how coal-fired powerhouse will be viable. Uh, you've answered that, but that's, as an engineer, I, I want to probe a little deeper with that. When you say viable, do you mean that we'll re maintain at 38 to 40 percent of the portfolio of this country of energy production? Um, we, we expect uh, coal to remain a, a substantial portion of the energy portfolio. No, no, even no. Under, I even on, even no, under you these, hear the question I asked the was, was 38 to 40 percent? Um, I, that's a pretty precise number. Um, okay, call it 35 to 40 percent yeah. then, at where it is now. Are we going to, is, is coal going to lose more under the, the, these regulations? It, just to remain viable, because you're the one that used the term viable. I'm trying to define viability. Okay. Uh, I also say viability is seven and a half cents per kilowatt hour in West Virginia. Okay. Are you saying that the, that the price of electricity is going to go up? Congressman, there are a number of factors that are affecting the power sector. Will price now. of electricity go up under your definition of viability? Um, I, I can't give you a prediction. And you can't on even, the, and you can't define whether or not it's going to be the 35 to 40 percent. Well, there are a number of factors that go into how much of the power in this country so we is could, produced Chris, by. Your term of viable, we could have less and less use of coal. I'm just concerned about all the coal miners and the people that work in these mines or the people that in the industry, how they're going to find jobs if, if it's less and less, and you're saying it's viable. I'm not so sure I'm, I'm into that. Uh, let me go to a third element very quickly with it. The, the United Nations panel came out with a report. Uh, they've, they've been doing it periodically. 
and they talk about that 96 percent of all CO2 emissions are naturally occurring. And what this whole fight is all about is just 4 percent. Do you agree that it's just 4 percent? Uh, I uh, don't agree. Four percent, I'm saying, is anthropogenic. I, I, I don't agree that anthropogenic emissions uh, are not a significant factor. That's in not the question. Stay the question, please. Is, do you agree with the United Nations that said four percent of all CO2 emissions come, by, come from man? I, I'm not familiar with that statement, Congressman. Okay. Do, but you will accept that the, uh, under the, well, maybe you don't uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, but uh, I think it was the Sierra Club, uh, maybe Earth Justice. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Al Gore has said that 30% uh, of all CO2, uh, of man-made CO2 emissions are, come from the deforestation of a tropical rainforest. So that would represent 1.2%. If it's 4%, 1.2% would be 30% of, of four. But yet coal-fired powerhouses only generate what? Do what, you know the number? Uh, they, two, they, tenths, they, two tenths of one percent of the CO2 emissions in the world come from American coal-fired powerhouses, six times less than the deforestation of a tropical rainforest. But yet, with all these regulations you're doing are putting at risk all the American workers in these powerhouses and coal mines and, and all across this country, it, two, tenths, two tenths of one percent you're willing to put all this, our economy, at risk for two-tenths of one percent. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. Coal-fired power plants are the largest source of carbon in the, that, in yeah, the they, country. That you, you, it's two-tenths of one percent of the global emissions. Six times worse in the deforestation of our tropical rainforest. But yet we're, so my question is, if we decarbonize America, that's what you're trying to do, What's, who are you going to blame the next time there's a snowstorm or there's a, another tornado? It, because we won't, be, we're, we won't be producing CO2 in America any longer. So who's the EPA going to blame next? There are many steps that need to be taken to reduce who carbon. Who will you blame the... next? If we don't produce CO2, what will be your excuse for the next tornado, the next Hurricane Sandy? I'm sorry, my time's run out. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witness for being here. And the topics we're addressing today, this hearing, are complicated and a wide range of views. I believe it when scientists tell us that man-made global warming is real. <clears throat> Personally, I believe to, to successfully regulate GHG emissions, Congress should develop a regulatory program that would promote economic growth and provide the responsible path forward. But until Congress moves to pass meaningful legislation, efforts such as this legislation are not the correct way to address that issue. Um, <clears throat> Ms. McKay, I'm coming from Texas in the Houston area. I've been interested, and in, I know we had uh, Secretary Moniz here a while back. I know that uh, Secretary Moniz visited the plan in Mississippi on uh, the, uh, this week and endorsed the technology. At this point, where are we with that CCS technology? Um, yes, the secretary was there um, and visited the plant. Um, the, the technology at that plant and several others is moving forward, um, and uh, so we are um, uh, looking forward to, to those projects um, uh, beginning operation um, and, and others considering it. Okay. I understand that uh, that particular facility, uh, my next question would be, the CCS uh, technologically and economically feasible for everyone because I know there have been some problems at the Mississippi plant. Well, the Mississippi plant has a variety of other activities going on beyond the, the CCS, um, but, but the technology is available uh, to, to plants widely. And we know from other EPA studies and proposals there's always concern about accurate data. Is the EPA 2012 proposal data still accurate enough to be effective? Uh, well, we always try to base our uh, rules on the most accurate data, and the transparent and open rulemaking process uh, makes sure that people have an opportunity to give us the most up-to-date data. So uh, before we would finalize any rule, we would make sure we had the, the most up-to-date data. Well, and again, coming from Texas, I know our state agencies are unique and have important information to assist them in balancing these economic demands. Um, in uh, keeping that in mind, how would you characterize the state's regulatory efforts up to this point 
and their importance moving forward? Well, the, 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 the states are uh, key regulatory partners in reducing pollution in this country and always have been, um, but the system that we have relies on the uh, uh, national standards being set for uh, major industries across the country so that, uh, the, so that the pathway is clear, so that uh, power plants built all across the country that are of uh, similar types would meet the same standards, and then the states very effectively implement those rules. I guess I'm still skeptical about the economic feasibility of that. Uh, in, in, you know, again, I'm looking forward to what happens in Mississippi because uh, whether it's coal or I represent a refining community, um, but and oftentimes, and we do, uh, uh, we do have storage places in, in Texas uh, that you can, uh, you know, store the carbon. But the president recently announced an end to the financing of overseas coal plants in emerging markets. This combined with the EPA actions are, have, are significant measures. Um, and again, we know what China is doing on coal, uh, and I'm sure we're not providing any overseas financing for that, but in other areas. Are they, is the administration action enough to really address climate change without strong mandatory reductions by other major emitters, including like China and India? Well, this is a global challenge, as you've indicated, and, and actions um, uh, will be need to be taken by many people. Um, part of the president's climate plan uh, is strong United States leadership internationally. Um, and one important uh, aspect of being a credible and strong leader internationally um, is to be doing the things we need to do here at home. Uh, so the, the, the plan includes very much both of those elements. I know um, the United States has reduced our carbon emissions over the last few years for lots of reasons. You know, downturn in the economy, uh, more fuel efficient vehicles, uh, but we've actually reduced our carbon emissions in our country, but in Western Europe and of course in the emerging nations, in the developing nations, um, there has been hardly any. In fact, it just continues to grow. And I share my colleagues from West Virginia concern, we can do everything we want to in this country on carbon. But unless our international partners and competitors are on the same wavelength, it doesn't do us any good except maybe price our, uh, our economy out of the world market. And that's, I think, a lot of our concerns. So, but I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, uh, Dr. Cassidy, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just kind of, uh, Ms. McCabe, I'm over here. Uh, let me build a little bit on the questions that Mr. Green just asked. Um, earlier, th earlier this year, I introduced the Energy Consumers Release, the Relief Act to provide greater relief and transparency about the cost and jobs impact of EPA regulations that cost at least a billion dollars. Now, first, let's just, if you will, kind of establish common ground. Will you, do you agree that EPA rules can, can affect the economy by raising electricity rates for consumers and business and et cetera? I, I agree that it's an important issue to look at, um, and a lot of information needs to be evaluated um, by, yeah. by experts. Now, one of the wonderful things we're hearing about right now is reshoring, where companies are bringing jobs back from places like China and India because our cost of electricity is so much less than theirs. We can't beat them on the price of labor. We're whacking them on the price of electricity. So, so again, building on what Mr. Green said, is it a concern at EPA that these regulations will effectively increase the cost of that electricity to the point that we will not have the same amount of reshoring, the same number of jobs being created in these energy intensive enterprises? We do enjoy, enjoy very low energy prices in this country and that has um, been the case throughout um, the history of the, of the Clean Air Act and improved um, efficiency and lowered emissions from power plants. Uh, so we have been able to maintain um, those low prices. Now that's certainly retrospectively, but if we speak going forward and a lot of rules are put in which effectively prejudice against coal, which is now what 40 something percent of our energy supply, do we have, a, do we have the risk of undoing that? That as we raise these, this cost of electricity, uh, what was true in the past will not be true in the future because these regulations serving as a form of a tax, raising the cost of electricity, adversely affect the movement of jobs back from overseas? 
the analysis that we do for this rule um, it will, will be the kind of analysis that we've done for previous rules, and I expect that, that this rule um, will uh, um, work in, in a similar fashion. Uh, now, that is now, I have some concern, which is why I had put, in for, put forward that law, if you will, about in, encouraging transparency. Uh, again, do you accept that there should be transparency about the potential cost of EPA regulations to ratepayers? Uh, e EPA um, uh, follows robust transparency and, and, and public input uh, processes for all of our rulemaking. Now, you say that, but during an EPA budget hearing this past spring, EPA's acting the EPA's acting administrator admitted that EPA had not done sufficient economy-wide modeling to account for the full economic impacts of its major rules, including higher rates paid by electricity consumers for the result of regulations, as a result of regulations. So let me ask, will you commit that for any regulations relating to existing power plants, including the pending greenhouse rules, that EPA will conduct economy-wide modeling to measure the cost of the higher electricity rates on households, businesses, and its effect upon the reshoring that we need to happen in order to recreate good jobs for, with good benefits for the working class of America? In all of our economic analysis that we do for our rules, EPA follows um, uh, OMB uh, procedures and uses appropriate um, peer-reviewed and transparent approaches, analysis um, and approaches. But I'm trying to reconcile that with the acting administrator admitting they had not done sufficient economy-wide modeling to account for the new um, the economic impacts of major rules. So it seems to be a little bit of discordance. You're saying that you have, and yet she is saying that, or he is saying that they had not. No, there's no disagreement there. Um, Economy-wide modeling um, is, is an approach that um, uh, has not been used in our rules um, because it, there are not appropriate analytical methods to do it. Now, on the other and hand, we, just say I'm almost out of time, but if you don't do that, then that gets back to where I was going with this. If you don't do the economy-wide, we don't understand the ripple effect smushing, if you will, the, the hoped-for reshoring of jobs. Uh, the, the agency has engaged with the, our science advisory board uh, to undertake right now uh, a, an inquiry into the types of appropriate models that would be used. So, so my fear is that if you don't come to a conclusion before these regulations are put out, the hope for reshoring of those jobs will not happen. Your regulations are creating uncertainty. Business hates uncertainty. They're not going to come back if, oh my gosh, all of a sudden our electricity rates are going up, will they? The regulations are creating, uh, are creating certainty so that plants will know. But you've not done your economy, it may be certainty of higher cost. You've not done your economy-wide modeling, and so therefore you don't know whether or not the energy-intensive enterprise will suddenly find themselves priced out, both on labor and on the cost of energy, correct? There has been an economic analysis done on the proposed rule. It'll, it's open for comment. And but, not econ but, but not economy-wide, you point out. Um, uh, because the methodologies for that approach are... are so therefore not, we don't know and so therefore we may be keeping jobs from reshoring because you don't know because we don't have the model. That is my fear. Mm -hmm. I'm out of time. I yield back. Gentlemen, it's time. This time I recognize the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Gardner, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Ms. McCabe, for your time here today and your testimony. Uh, you just mentioned that, uh, and I wanted to follow up with Mr. Cassidy, that your regulations create certainty. Uh, you just said that. Um, does your regulation make electricity more or less affordable? Um, our regulation, uh, as required by uh, 111B of the Clean Air Act, is intended to um, require for future power plants um, uh, uh, state-of-the-art technologies. Well, excuse that will just if it's a, if you don't mind, I have a series of these questions. Uh, does it make it does it make electricity more or less affordable? Um, the, it, the, the, the rules that we will be requiring um, will um, uh, allow uh, uh, coal plants to proceed in a, in a way that um, is... Uh, right, but I'm trying to get to the certainty that you said your regulation creates. So mm -hmm. if, if, if this regulation creates certainty, mm -hmm. does your regulation make electricity more or less affordable? We do not expect that these rules will um, uh, make uh, uh, electricity uh, less affordable in this country okay. as plants are able to plan ahead and build plants that will, will meet the requirements. So will it make electricity more or less expensive then? Maybe that's a better way to put it. 
Um, these are the kinds of things that we look at in our uh, economic analysis and, and, and Right, so everybody to can keep that certainty and to keep the certainty that you said these rules provide, does it make electricity more or less expensive? Um, the analysis um, uh, may show that the addition of additional equipment um, will uh, increase costs to... Okay, so there's the certainty right there. So it, it will increase electricity costs. Thank you. Um, you said you did economic viability projections analysis. Were you at the coal hearing in Denver that the EPA held, the listening session in Denver? No, I wasn't. Okay. So have you, do you do economic viable studies of communities where they produce coal? We do economic analysis of, of the proposed rules that, that we are looking at. But, I mean, do you look at the communities where there's a coal mine and there's employers, employees there? I mean, do you look at the economic viability of those communities and what happens uh, in, in this rule that you're certain will make electricity make, more, make electricity more expensive? Um, I should uh, amend what I said a minute ago or clarify what I said a minute ago. Um, the, the analysis that we've put forward on this rule um, does uh, show that this particular rule will not increase electricity prices. Okay. Do you believe that overall regulations at EPA increase the cost of electricity? Um, I, I, Looking at this regulation in combination with other regulations that have come through on uh, greenhouse gases or electricity production from coal? Uh, there are many factors that affect electricity prices over time, um, and environmental uh, regulations have been uh, shown to be um, a very, very small uh, uh, aspect of what increases prices over time. Do you time. think those price increases have a, a larger um, impact on people who may be on a fixed income? Um, I, I, the, the price of electricity overall um, is, uh, is something that, that, that affects people. But uh, as I said, the, the, uh, um, the, the contribution of environmental regulation to those uh, cost changes is minimal. All right. Just a, a couple of other questions. Um, for existing plants, uh, do you agree that states will have a primary role in setting performance standards for electric generating units? Uh, for existing plants, the role that states have is to design the plan at the state level that will meet the guidelines that the EPA will establish. So the states will have a primary role in setting Under the Regional Haze Program, this is what I'm getting at, which is a, also a program intended to be implemented primarily by the states, EPA has been routinely disapproving a SIP plans uh, and seeking to impose federal imp implementation plans that require plant owners to spend millions of dollars or shut down uh, their units. Uh, where states object or challenge the EPA, EPA then proceeds to enforce these federal implementation plans through litigation. We've got examples of these in Arizona, New Mexico, Montana, North Dakota, Oklahoma, Utah, and Wyoming. Uh, will you provide me with an assurance that EPA will give states more deference under its pending greenhouse gas regulations that the agency has done under the Regional Haze Program? EPA, in fact, has approved the majority of the Regional Haze Plans. So will, will, you, will you, again, the question is, uh, will you give states more deference under its pending greenhouse gas regulations that the agency has under its Regional Haze Program? Uh, EPA will work with the states, as we always do, uh, when they have the authority to design state plans, uh, to make sure that those state plans meet the federal target. Uh, and I have some additional questions. In the State Department, when we had Gina McCarthy, Administrator McCarthy, uh, before the committee last year, we talked about uh, new source performance standards for power plants. And in our exchange, she testified that she could not rule out uh, uh, regulation of any of the 70 source categories uh, under EPA's new source performance standards program, which covered all types of industrial activities. Is that still your position, that you cannot rule any source out? Uh, we are focused on the actions laid out in the President's uh, Climate Action Plan, um, which, which uh, has power plants as the, the rulemaking that we are. Are there any source categories the EPA can affirmatively rule out of greenhouse gas regulations? Um, there are m m many uh, source categories that EPA regulates that we so have, can't that rule, we have can't no, rule any of them that out. We have no present okay. intention of. Uh, if the EPA out. doesn't pursue regulation of all these emission sources, can the EPA guarantee that uh, there will not be lawsuits to compel the regulation? I, 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 I can't guarantee that there won't be lawsuits. The EPA gets sued all the time, but uh, we make our decisions about what to do based on the science and uh, priority setting, and uh, power plants are clearly the largest source of carbon in the country. And the chairman's been incredibly indulgent with my time. And just finally, one last question. Uh, can the EPA provide an assurance that there won't be an ever-expanding suite of EPA greenhouse gas regulations? As I said, we are focused on uh, the, the source category that uh, contributes the most carbon pollution in, in this country. So there could continue to be an ever-expanding suite? 
there are um, a, a number of source categories that I would not expect to, us to be uh, looking at in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, and we are be interested in finding out what those are. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hall, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, Ms. McCabe, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics reported back earlier in November uh, 2013 that the, there were 11.3 million Americans unemployed, and including 4.1 million long-term unemployed. And they also reported 8.1 million underemployed individuals, those working part-time or, or uh, had been cut back on the work or couldn't find a full-time job. Would you agree that raising energy prices when we're facing such chronic levels of unemployment is not in the best interest of the economy? Uh, we're, Congressman, we're um, very concerned, as you are, about jobs in this country and about oh, the economy in this that, country. I know you are that, but just answer my question. Um, uh, we don't believe that, uh, that, that moving forward with these regulations it will be detrimental um, to uh, the economy of this country. Well, for the last three years, EPA has been telling us that they don't intend to implement a cap-and-trade program to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And as recently as May 15th, I think, of this year, Assistant Administrator McCarthy, who is testifying just below us here today, uh, stated in response to our committee that, quote, both former Administrator Jackson and I have said in the past that EPA has no intention of pursuing a cap-and-trade program for greenhouse gases, and I continue to stand by these statements. Yet, EPA appears to be contemplating a, quote, system-based approach, unquote, for regulating existing power plants in a document entitled Questions for State Partners which has to do with EPA's planned greenhouse gas regulations for existing power plants. EPA asked questions relating to measures like this, resource planning requirements, uh, end-use energy, efficiency resource standards, renewable energy portfolio standards, and appliance and building code energy standards. These measures seem to me, and maybe I'm wrong about it, but they seem to me uh, that they're they're the types of programs that were included in the cap and trade legislation. It was rejected by this Congress, I think, some two or three years ago, and I think you're aware of that. Yeah. Uh, looking at EPA's documents, uh, that sounds like a backdoor cap and trade. And I'll just ask you these questions, just get right to the point. Talking about the planned greenhouse regulations for existing plants, is EPA considering requiring states to adopt these types of programs? No, Congressman, this is not a cap-and-trade program at all. Uh, this is a program that allows states to develop flexible state plans. Well, you are whatever you're acting and whatever positions you take. And when EPA says the agency, quote, has no intention of pursuing a cap-and-trade program for greenhouse gases, does that just mean it's a national level? Well, it's not up to us to develop the state plans. We, we are not developing a cap-and-trade program, nor will we require any state to put one in place. So that's my next question. I thank you for answering it. Might EPA effectively require it at the state level? It would be entirely up to the state how they would want to approach okay. meeting the target. A, a cap-and-trade program is, is, is not required. I think that's fair enough, Now, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Hall, and uh, I think that concludes uh, our uh, questioners, and I'm sure the people on the third panel are delighted with that. Uh, Ms. McCabe, before you go, I want to ask one question. Uh, Ms. I would just follow up on Mr. Gardner. Is it your, is it your opinion, uh, your belief that the states have the actual authority to set the performance standards for existing plants, or are you saying EPA will set the national stand, uh, the standard of performance for existing plants in the states? EPA will set the target, but then the states will have flexibility to meet that in whatever way makes sense to them. So it does not need to be a unit-by-unit unit 
um, uh, regulation or expectation. And, when, and you all are working on this already, even though you're not expected to have it until the summer of 2015. Is that correct? Well, our proposal will be out in June of 2014. Uh, yeah. We are uh, gathering yeah. information right now in order to inform the proposal that we okay. will put together. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to your coming back and spending more time with us. All right. Thank you. Yeah. This time I'd like to call up the third panel of witnesses, and uh, I want to thank them for their patience and for the long distance that they've come. We appreciate that. Uh, first of all, we have the Honorable Scott Pruitt, who's the Attorney General from the great state of Oklahoma. We have the Honorable Henry Hale, who is the mayor of Fulton, Arkansas, which I believe is the location of the Turk plant near Texarkana. We have Mr. Tony Campbell, who is CEO and President of the East Kentucky Power Cooperative. We have Ms. Susan Tierney, who is Managing Principal of the Analysis Group. We have Mr. David Hawkins, who is the Director of Climate Programs at the Natural Resources Defense Council. And uh, then we have Ed. Yeah, we have Mr. Ed Chikanowitz, who is an engineering consultant. We have Dr. Donald R. Vandervaart, Chief Permitting Section, North Carolina Department of Environment and Natural Resources Division of Air Quality. And we have Mr. Ross Eisenberg, who's Vice President of Energy and Resources Policy at the National Association of Manufacturers. Thank you for being here. And uh, I'll recognize each one of you for five minutes uh, for your opening statement, and then uh, we'll have some questions for you. Uh, so, Attorney General Pruitt, we'll recognize you first. Thanks for being with us today, and you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield, uh, Congressman McNerney, and members of the subcommittee, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to join you today to discuss concerns from a state perspective of the EPA's proposed standards of greenhouse gas emissions on new power plants. This is an issue of great concern for Oklahoma and other states who were given authority by Congress to develop and implement emission standards from existing power plants. In recent years, the EPA has expressed an unwillingness to appropriately defer to state authority under the Clean Air Act. The prospect of aggressive performance standards for new coal-based power plants is a cause for serious concern among the various states. The EPA has indicated a similarly aggressive approach to existing coal-based power plants for which the President has directed the EPA to propose standards by June 1st of 2014 and to finalize those rules by June 1st of 2015. While the Clean Air Act gives the EPA the authority to develop the framework for the states to establish emission standards for existing power plants, the EPA may not dictate to the states what those standards should be. The states are allowed to engage in a cost-benefit analysis and consider a wide range of factors in setting those standards. This is important to note because the EPA's new emission standard, under the guise of flexible approaches, quote unquote, mandates new coal-based power plants use costly carbon capture storage technology. This technology, this is technology that likely remains commercially unviable for at least a decade. The U.S. Energy Information Administration projects coal-based electric, electric generation will provide 40 percent of baseload energy in this country in 2014. The elimination of coal-based electric generation would result in higher electricity prices for our ratepayers. It would be detrimental to the national and state economies, as well as job creation and other things. Increased electricity prices also will hurt the competitiveness of American manufacturing. I and the Attorney Generals of 16 other states recently submitted to the EPA a white paper outlining those concerns and our position on both the EPA and the state's role under Section 111D of the Clean Air Act. I've submitted that white paper to, to you this morning. Unfortunately, this is not the only issue to which the states and the EPA are at odds over the scope of their respective responsibilities. The congressman from Colorado referenced the Regional Hays Program. Many states, including Oklahoma, are actively engaged in legal challenges to thwart the EPA's attempt to expand its authority under the Regional Hays Program. Under the Clean Air Act's Regional Hays Rules, a target date of 2064 was set to achieve natural visibility in federally designated areas across the country. Regional Hays deals with issues of aesthetics, not health, and visibility and safety of the public health. As such, the Clean Air Act gives states the primary role in establishing regulations. 
in Oklahoma, stakeholders joined together, worked with utilities to construct a plan for regional haze and submitted that in 2010 that allowed for fuel diversity and balanced environmental protection and the need for affordable energy. Our state plan accomplished those objectives for the regional haze rule and exceeded the target date of 2064 by nearly four decades. The EPA rejected Oklahoma's state implementation plan in favor of a federal implementation plan, which would cost the state utilities almost $2 billion within three years. What's more, the federal plan would provide less environmental benefits than the state plan and is estimated to increase costs for Oklahoma ratepayers by much, as much as 20 percent. Our state made the decision to sue the EPA over its decision. This is a case of first impression under the, Region Hays, under the regional Hayes rule adopted in 2005 and will likely potentially end up before the U.S. Supreme Court. Many states are monitoring that case as the decision will impact their ability to set policy within their jurisdiction. There's a great deal of frustration among the states with the EPA's attitude and it, that ignores the proper role of the states as the agency attempts to expand its authority. The EPA seems to have a view that the states are merely a vessel to implement whatever policies and regulations the administration sees fit, regardless of the wisdom, cost, or efficiency of such measures. Fortunately for the states, that is not what the law allows. Congress clearly intended for the states to have primacy in the areas of environmental regulation and for the EPA to work with the states closely to regulate those issues. However, the e EPA is attempting to usurp the role of the states and all in the name of opposing the administration's anti-fossil fuel mentality. The extent and form of greenhouse gas regulation is important to the states. The states have the experience, expertise, and ability to regulate those issues and must be allowed to play their proper roles established by Congress. We hope that by making our concerns known here today and beyond that the EPA will re respect the principles of cooperative federalism, something that's been talked about here today, that are all set forth in the Clean Air Act and take a more common sense approach to any new regulations that include the states in that process. If not, we will attempt to obtain relief from the courts, and we will certainly welcome congressional oversight being brought to bear on these federal agencies. I look forward, Mr. Chairman, to answering your questions you may have today and others, and thank you for the time this morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pruitt. And Mayor Hale, you're recognized for five minutes, and just be sure to put your microphone on so we can hear you. Uh, Mr. Chairman Whitfield, a member of this committee. It's a great honor to sit here today and testify before the committee about uh, the Southwest uh, Western Electric Power Company, a unit of American uh, electric power which began serving customers back in 1912, made the announcement in 2006 to build a power plant in southwest Arkansas, the John W. Turk plant, which later became the single largest project ever constructed uh, in the county where I live, with a capital investment of $1.8 billion. Hempstead County, which had been around since uh, 1995, founded in 1818, is eternally grateful to Swepco and AP for the decision to build just a mile or two up the road from my hometown. The plant went in commercial operation on December 20, 2012. Swepco went to great length to overcome major environmental and illegal challenges in building Turk, one of the cleanest, most efficient coal fuel electric generating plant in North America. It was the culmination of six years of successful engineering, construction, legal, and regulatory effort. Turk is an exemplical example of how well-planned teamwork and coordination can make a project of this magnitude come together. It is the first power plant in the U.S. to use ultra-supercritical steam technology, which requires the plant to use less coal, thereby lowering the uh, level of emission, including carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and mercury. The Turk plant is a 600 megawatt facility that provides operation 24 hours a day to meet the growing electrical need of SWEPCO and co-ops. Customers in Arkansas, Louisiana, and Texas. SWEPCO relies how important it is to plan for the future energy supply for our state's community and customers. The Turk plant is good for the local economy while America was enduring difficult economic time. The Turk plant provided construction jobs for a peak of over 2,000 workers and bring tax revenue to local government. Construction alone generate $38 million in sale and property revenue. The plant has 109 permanent jobs with an annual payroll of $9 million. The plant pays about $6 million in annual school and county property tax. It's 
I certainly appreciate the tax support generated to the local school districts, which I am an employee. But it is not about the plant. SUPCO gave the local college, the University of Arkansas Community College, to hope a $1 million grant to start up a power plant technology degree program early on the process. Hundreds have graduated and many are able to get jobs at Turk Plant, enhancing education in part of the state of Arkansas that desperately needed in recent years. The Turk team impact the local community in a positive way with toy drive, park improvement for nearby Hope, Fulton, and McNabb. Construction workers and SWEPCO employees also on site gave their time, money, and materials to improve the life of others in the area. The Turk plant has won several awards this year, including the Edison Award for Edison Electric Institution, the 2013 Plant of the Year Award for Power Magazine, and the 2012 Project of the Year in the Best Coal Fuel Project category from Power Plant. I thank you for allowing me to speak this, uh, to you today. And thank you. Mayor, thanks so much. And Mr. Campbell, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member McNerney, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear, appear before you today. My name is Tony Campbell. I am President and CEO of East Kentucky Power Cooperative, and I have served in that position since 2009. East Kentucky Power Cooperative is a generation and transmission cooperative based in Winchester, Kentucky. East Kentucky Power Cooperative and its 16 owner member cooperatives exist to serve the end consumer. East Kentucky Power Cooperative generates electricity at three baseload power plants fueled by coal and one peaking plant fueled by natural gas. More than 90 percent of the power that's generated is fueled by coal. East Kentucky Power Cooperative's total generating capacity is about 3,000 megawatts and we employ about 700 employees. More than one million Kentucky residents and businesses in 87 counties depend on the power we generate. We also serve some of the neediest Kentuckians. The household income of Kentucky cooperative members is 7.4 percent below the state average and 22 percent below the national average. East Kentucky Power Cooperative supports a bipartisan uh, Whit uh, Whitfield Mansion discussion draft bill is common sense legislation that provides important guidelines and parameters for EPA to follow in developing greenhouse gas regulations for new and existing power plants without causing irreparable harm to the U.S. economy. This bipartisan bill is badly needed to ensure EPA does not promulgate a rule that jeopardizes the country's energy future, puts electricity reliability at risk, and severely harms the economy. While East Kentucky Power Cooperative sympathizes with the need to address climate change issues on a global scale, we should not impose immediate changes to this country's electric infrastructure, forcing utilities to rely on undeveloped technologies as the answer. That risk may prove greater than the, risk, than the issue it was intended to solve. Congress never intended for the Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from power plants. This fact is illustrated by EPA's attempts to promulgate greenhouse gas new source performance standards under Section 111, the administration's proposed greenhouse gas performance standards, first issued in April 2012, demonstrated unequivocally that the administration seek to end new coal generation through regulation. In that proposal, EPA chose not to establish a separate standard for coal-fired units. Instead, it lumped coal units together with natural gas-fired units into a new new source performance standard subcategory and established a greenhouse gas emission limit that only some natural gas combined cycle units can achieve. These proposed Section 111 regulations have already had a chilling impact on electricity generation in the U.S. While the current low price of natural gas has contributed to the decline in coal-fired electricity generation and the resurgence of natural gas-fired units, EPA's new regulations are an equally important factor in this trend. In recent years, electric utilities have faced a daunting array of environmental regulations on all fronts, air, water, and waste, that have contributed to the widespread coal-fired unit retirements. Coal-fired generation is essential to ensure energy diversity and to keep the electricity prices low. There is also a significant national security issue that I would like to heighten for you, highlight for you. In addition to the realities and risk of rising natural gas prices, it is simply not feasible or prudent for the nation's entire existing coal-fired generation capacity to be tra transitioned to natural gas. Natural gas generation requires transportation from natural gas wells to power plants via an intricate network of interstate pipelines 
and compressor stations that allow the gas to be constantly pressurized. These requirements raise not only infrastructure concerns, but also national security concerns. If a compressor station were to fail or become the victim of a terrorist attack, the nation's electric grid could be placed in jeopardy. When these natural gas supply requirements are contrasted with coal, which is plentiful in supply, can be stockpiled at least uh, stockpiled at a 30 to 45 day supply and can be transported by several different methods without the use of interstate pipelines, it makes no sense to require wholesale conversions from coal fire generation to natural gas, particularly in areas of the country that are rich in coal resources and are not located in close proximity to natural gas wells. Coal fired power plants in the U.S. only contribute approximately 4 percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions. The U.S. power fleet has already reduced CO2 emissions by 16 percent below 2005 levels, with CO2 from coal-fired power plants reduced by almost 25 percent. EPA should allow coal-fired power plants to continue to make these reductions in a reasonable manner and in response to market pressures, instead of by regulatory fiat. Furthermore, the regulation at issue will not have a meaningful impact on global climate change. The minimal impact that these regulations will have on the environment further underscores the need for all greenhouse gas regulations to be economically achievable. While East Kentucky Power Cooperative has significant concerns with proposed regulations of the new sources, particularly the assumptions on carbon capture and sequestration technology, our greatest concern relates to regulations for existing sources. Pursuant to the consent decree with EPA, East Kentucky Power Cooperative has invested almost $1 billion in retrofitting our existing coal-fired power plants over the last decade with modern air pollution control equipment. In addition, we have invested more than $1 billion and installed two new cleanest coal-fired units in the country. An existing source rule that requires carbon capture and sequestration would leave East Kentucky Power Cooperative with no choice but to convert these units to natural gas, essentially wasting the extensive capital investment that we have been forced to make to lower pollutants from the coal-fired units. This would result because there is currently no demonstrated technology that would be able to control greenhouse gas emissions. Mr. Campbell, your time is about really has expired, if you just summarize real quick. I'll summarize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To summarize, East Kentucky Power Cooperative appreciates the work of this committee and the opportunity to present our views the EPA's regulations on greenhouse gas from power plants. I would like to reaffirm East Kentucky Power Cooperative's support for Whitfield Mansion discussion draft bill. Thank, Thank you, you very you much. much. And Ms. Tierney, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative McNerney, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the chance to be here. I understand the premise for the bill you're considering today is a concern that the EPA's actions will have the effect of barring the ability of coal in new power plants and existing power plants and will have an, a negative impact on electricity com consumers in the economy. In light of the market realities that we're experiencing in the United States today and ahead, I think this concern is misplaced for several reasons. First, various abundant domestic energy resources are competing to supply affordable, reliable, and clean electricity supply. That's happening now, and it's good for Americans. Second, EPA is taking action under Section 111 will help to clarify the rules of the road under which coal and natural gas will compete with each other and with other power supplies and technologies in the future. Having clear rules and regulatory stability will help a positive investment environment at a time when the nation stands to spend up to a trillion dollars on new generating capacity in uh, parts of the country. Third, putting the rules in place will help EPA address pollutants that have been found to threaten public health and the welfare of current and future generations, and they will allow a pathway for coal and natural gas to be part of our vibrant energy supply. EPA's action under Section 111 is important for public health and is consistent with domestic energy resource development and use as part of a reliable, affordable, competitive, clean energy supply. And there are several reasons why I reached that opinion. First, coal has been the dominant fuel and remains the dominant fuel used to, to generate electricity in the United States in no small part because of its affordability in its price. Second, the level of coal use has varied 
uh, dramatically over the years as new developments in technologies and fuel developments and prices have brought about changes in the supply mix, uh, including nuclear power, renewable energy, and much more natural gas. Until recently, these economic conditions greatly favored the use of coal, but the shale gas revolution has fundamentally changed that situation. This other abundant domestic supply is now economically accessible and can supply 100 years at today's uh, levels of consumption, and it can play an important role in helping the U.S. reduce greenhouse gas emissions from power supply. Abundant domestic supply of renewable energy also can supply these outcomes. Currently, low gas prices are putting economic pressure on coal facilities. Uh, we see the forward natural gas prices continuing to make it attractive to invest in natural gas as compared to coal-fired generator facilities. This economic pressure is lowering, not raising, electricity prices and has been the case uh, around the country. And there is more market pressure on coal as a result of that. This has contributed to the announcements of retirements of some of the oldest and least efficient coal-fired generating units and the economics of over 100 power plants that have been proposed to be built on coal have been uh, gradually canceled because of those poor economic alternatives. Today, the fuel of choice is natural gas for power generation, uh, as well as renewable power projects. And as we've heard today, it's away from coal. The bottom line for electricity market fundamentals is that coal and natural gas are in strong competition, will remain so. Uh, they were at head-to-head -head competition in terms of market shares a year ago in 2012, and coal has regained a small portion of the competitive uh, share that gas had taken away. These market dynamics have been important for helping the United States and the electric industry provide power reliably and affordably to consumers at low prices, and that will continue. They are affording the U.S. the opportunity to diversify, not otherwise, its overall mix of supplies. The industry's responses to the EPA regulations will stimulate much needed economic activity and modernization of the electric system. Again, the investors in this industry need certainty, and the EPA greenhouse gas rules are providing that in light of the fact that they have been expected for many years uh, and are on their way. The recent changes in coal use have taken place at a time when production has remained relatively strong, in large part because of the export growth that we've seen. And finally, let me just summarize by saying that the EPA's 111 regulations for new and existing power plants will allow flexibility and pathways for coal and gas to play a, an important role going forward in our electricity supply. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Hawkins, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to offer a few facts for the subcommittee's con consideration. Uh, first, if we continue to use our atmosphere as a dump for carbon pollution, we will wreck the climate. Now, coal-fired power plants are the largest carbon pollution source uh, in the United States. And more than 40 years ago, Congress authorized in the Clean Air Act EPA to protect the public against harmful air pollution. And the Supreme Court has confirmed that that authority includes the authority to regulate harmful carbon pollution. EPA is moving ahead to set sensible standards for carbon pollution from power plants, and it is following an approach that has been used for 43 years by seven presidents prior to President Obama. President Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Clinton, and George W. Bush. All of those presidents uh, presided over EPA uh, standard setting that looked at available technologies to control a pollution stream, looked at whether those technologies were transferable or already applied in the category being considered for regulation, and looked at what the costs would be and whether those costs would be reasonable. That's exactly what EPA has done for the proposed uh, standard for new coal-fired power plants. Now, uh, and it has based that technology on gas uh, 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 CO2 capture uh, systems, which have been demonstrated for decades in other major industry categories. The power sector has not used that uh, technology yet. 
but that is not an argument against EPA's proposed standards. For the power sector did not use SO2 scrubbers, NOx controls, or mercury controls until government required them to use those controls. Now a few words about costs. Uh, partial carbon capture, which is the basis for EPA's standard for new coal plants, can easily achieve that standard with reasonable added costs. What was EPA's basis for that? Well, it looked at a number of Department of Energy studies and projected that a new coal plant with partial carbon capture would have electricity production costs about 20 percent higher than a coal plant with no carbon capture controls. Now, the cost difference would be much less if revenues from enhanced oil recovery sales were included. EPA has also announced a schedule for guidelines to control carbon pollution from existing power plants, working in cooperation with state clean air officials. NRDC's own analyses using an accepted government and industry model demonstrates that we can achieve significant reductions in carbon pollution from existing power plants with benefits of about 25 to 60 billion dollars annually compared to compliance costs of about 4 billion dollars. Our approach would not require the use of carbon capture on existing plants, though that or any other measure that would reduce carbon pollution could qualify as a compliance measure. Now, the draft legislation by uh, Representative Whitfield and Senator Manchin would repeal EPA's carbon pollution authority for existing power plants and essentially would allow the power sector to dictate what standards could be adopted for new coal plants. That's not the way the Clean Air Act was written. It's not the way any of the seven uh, presidents before have uh, implemented it. This legislation would harm Americans by allowing excess carbon pollution from power plants that would stay in the, in the air for centuries, disrupting the climate that sustains our civilization. Ironically, the legislation would not improve the lot of coal producers or co communities in coal country. Rather, it would destroy power sector interest in deploying carbon capture and storage systems, the one technology that could provide a pathway for more sustainable use of coal. Bills to cut Clean Air Act protections against carbon pollution will not solve the coal sector's problems. Power companies have choices other than coal, and as long as carbon policy remains temporarily locked in a closet, the industry will look elsewhere for their power investments. It makes no sense to invest billions of dollars in a new coal plant when there's no resolution of the rules that will apply to its carbon pollution. Congress cannot make this problem disappear by forcing EPA to close its eyes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. And uh, Mr. Chikanowitz, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Whitfield and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. For more than four decades, I have designed and tested environmental controls for fossil power stations. This morning, I'll summarize my opinion on the status of carbon capture and sequestration and present a few graphics to sh show what the design challenges are. CCS differs from all controls previously adopted to power stations to date. The amount of CO2 removed from the gas stream is at least 15 times the amount of sulfur dioxide that is removed by flue gas to sulfurization when using a high sulfur coal. The CO2 once captured in most cases must be transported at least dozens of miles and the ultimate sink is well below the Earth's surface. All three of these steps have yet to be conducted at full scale on a coal-fired power station. Let's look at a commercial design for one of the three options to control CO2. Exhibit one shows the preliminary design of a 750 megawatt power station equipped with post-combustion control. This station was uh, proposed but n not actually built. The equipment in red the equipment in red shows the boiler and steam turbine that produce the power. Encircled in green are the conventional controls for the emissions of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, particulate matter, and trace species such as mercury. Encircled in blue is the CO2 capture equipment. The array of towers on the right absorb CO2 and those on the left regenerate CO2. What's noticeable is the size of the equipment. It's much larger than the conventional environmental controls. You can appreciate why it's important to get this design right and get it right the first time. The problem is that we have limited data from which to base the design. So we must do three things with our data. The first is to scale results from small pilots 
and early demonstrations to enable designing a large commercial unit. The second is to generalize results or extend what we learn with one coal at one site to the variety of coals and sites that we will encounter around the U.S. And the third, most important, is to make sure that all the individual components work together. Exhibit 2 helps explain a critical step in scaling. Exhibit 2 shows the largest pilot plant operating in the U.S. right now that's testing this particular process. It's at Alabama Power's plant, Barry. This pilot plant treats the gas flow equal to about 25 megawatts of capacity. The test towers for CO2 absorption and regeneration are designed to look like the core, like an apple core, from a commercial uh, reactor. So if we were designing a system for Exhibit 1 right now, we would scale this Barry pilot plant results by a factor of 37. For some steps, this is straightforward and can be done with confidence, but for many steps, it cannot be done. There are two other methods to capture CO2, the pre-combustion method that is used with gasified coal and oxycombustion. I believe all three options, given time, have an equal chance to be commercially proven. There are additional pilot plants and demonstrations coming online in the next few years, but their numbers are few and the results will take a while to acquire. Exhibit 3 shows a timeline of pilot plant small commercial and demonstration units that I think will influence CCS feasibility in the U.S. Most of these are in North America, but several are in Europe. The timeline shows the date when operations begin, and on the vertical axis it shows the size of the test or demonstration unit in terms of the equivalent capacity. I've included both pre-combustion and oxy-combustion options on the chart, and these are distinguished by different symbols. I've also distinguished between projects that are operating or in construction. Those are the ones with the symbols filled in, which I understand you can't see real well, but they tend to be more on the lower left. Uh, the projects that are not yet financed are represented by the open symbols. Although the Great Plains Sinfields unit has operated with pre-combustion control for years, we need to generalize results beyond the lignite fuel that it uses and the co-production of chemicals and power. The final graphic highlights the utility demonstrations in the circle on the right. Exhibit 3 shows that only a few demonstration projects will be operating in the next several years. And please recognize the importance is not the, is not the start date, but the date when we acquire experience that we can use in coming up with a design. And that will be several years from startup. There are equally challenging issues concerning CO2 sequestration or reuse. These include, for example, the distribution of CO2 sinks throughout the U.S., the predicted five to ten year period to confidently map the details of the site, and the potentially confounding role of property rights. My written testimony further addresses these topics. In summary, CCS at some time in the future may prove a feasible technology to control CO2 emissions. In my opinion, we need until about 2020 to make this assessment with a reasonable degree of confidence. CCS is not commercially proven now. For it to be so, we need to populate that circle on the right with many more symbols and the need to be closed, showing financed operating units not open. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Vandervaart, you recognize five minutes. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. I am with the state of North Carolina. Thank you for the... You, your microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm with the state of North Carolina, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Before I comment on the specifics of EPA's use of Section 111 of the Act, I'd wanted to note issues that my comments will not address. First, my comments are not about the scientific uncertainty of the impact anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions have on climate. My comments do not address the accuracy or inaccuracy of the IPCC models relied upon by the EPA or the divergence between the models, predictions, and the actual temperatures over the past 15 years. These issues are critical to any decision on whether, in the absence of congressional authorization, EPA should regulate greenhouse gas emissions from stationary sources. Against this background, I offer three specific concerns about EPA's current actions to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel-fired electric generating units. First, EPA is required by Congress to base any new source performance standard on a best system of emission reductions that the administrator determines has been adequately demonstrated. EPA's recently proposed NSPS for utility units assumed carbon capture and storage, or CCS, has been adequately demonstrated. 
One need only look at the yet to operate Kemper County Energy Facility in Mississippi with its substantial governmental funding as prima facie evidence that the EPA's conclusions are unsupported. Even if a, best, a state is blessed with the requisite geologic formations, facilities would be required to build miles of pipelines simply to reach the formation. EPA's proposed approach will pit the reliability of this nation's electricity supply against the considerable uncertainty of environmental permitting of these pipelines superimposed on an unproven technology of CCS. Sound science, rather than speculation, should drive environmental regulation. Second, the traditional function of Section 111 was to protect or grandfather existing facilities to prevent their migration to less polluting areas, polluted areas of the country. The 1990 amendments to 111D were true to this tradition by prohibiting the overlap of 111D for existing sources with two other programs in the Act. Section 111D prohibits EPA from regulating pollutants from source categories regulated under Section 112. In 2011, EPA issued regulations under Section 112 applicable to fossil fuel-fired electric generating units, thereby foreclosing regulation under Section 111D. In the past, EPA suggested that there is a conflict in the statutory language of Section 111D with regard to whether one, the 112 prohibition was pollutant-specific or source category-specific. This is a false choice, as there is no internal conflict in Section 111D. Prior to 1990, Section 112 was pollutant-specific. In 1990, the structure of Section 112 was changed from one that regulated pollutants to one that regulated source categories. To prevent overlap with the newly structured 112 program, 111D was augmented to exclude not only Section 112 pollutants, but also Section 112 regulated source categories. The two exclusions are entirely self-consistent and should not be used to invoke Chevron deference. Section 111D also prohibits regulating pollutants listed under Section 108. A pollutant must be listed under Section 108 when three criteria are satisfied. Those criteria were satisfied when EPA published its endangerment finding under Section 202. While North Carolina takes no position on whether EPA should establish a NAAQS for greenhouse gases, all of the conditions necessary to list greenhouse gases under Section 108 have already been met. The listing in itself prohibits EPA from regulating greenhouse gas emissions under Section 111D. Indeed, EPA may already be under a pre-existing non-discretionary duty to issue criteria and simultaneously propose a national ambient air quality standard for greenhouse gases. Finally, in the case where EPA does have authority to establish emission guidelines under Section 111D, that authority is limited. EPA is not authorized to impose emission standards on existing sources. Rather, EPA can only establish a unit-specific guideline that describes what control technologies have been demonstrated. Once EPA provides that guideline, Section 111D allows states to develop unit-specific emission standards after considering many factors, including the cost, physical constraints on installing controls, and the remaining useful lifetime of the emission units. The plain language of the Act, as well as the legal precedent, precludes EPA and states from designing a standard that relies on reductions made outside of the emission unit. Any flexibility in compliance with a standard based on a specific unit specific emission standard resides with the states who have the primary responsibility for implementation of this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Mr. Eisenberg, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for having me today uh, on behalf of the NAM. We're at a crossroads on energy and climate. Our nation is truly awash of every single type of energy, be it oil, gas, coal, nuclear, renewables, energy efficiency. This robust all of the above portfolio and policy and our commitment to it is helping fuel a manufacturing resurgence in this country. It's a good thing. However, the very same government that is presiding over this and is, and is, and is benefiting from this uh, is perilously close to enacting policies that would stop us from using most of this energy. And many of these decisions would be irreversible and could limit manufacturers' long-term competitiveness. Now, manufacturers are committed to protecting the environment through greater environmental sustainability, increased energy efficiency and conservation, and by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We believe that policies to reduce greenhouse gas, gases, uh, whether legislative or regulatory, must be done in a thoughtful, deliberative manner and transpa transparent process that ensures a competitive level playing field for U.S. companies in the global marketplace. And it should focus on cost-effective reductions, be implemented in concert with all major emitting nations, and take into account all relevant greenhouse gas sources and sinks. Unfortunately, our government has settled on a climate policy that really meets none of these objectives, regulation under the Clean Air Act. 
But as inflexible and unforgiving as the Act tends to be with respect to greenhouse gases, many of the choices that EPA is making to implement the Act for greenhouse gases are equally problematic. We know from the President's Climate Action Plan that he believes the only way to reduce greenhouse gases in the U.S. is to stop using fossil fuels. We disagree. We believe that we can use fossil fuels while also innovating and manufacturing the technologies needed to limit the resulting emissions. However, EPA's greenhouse gas NSPS regulations set us on a clear path toward elimination and nothing else. And so what really should be a policy on climate winds up looking suspiciously like a means to an end. The standard for new power plants bans conventional coal-fired power based on EPA's assertion that partial CCS has been adequately demonstrated taking into account costs and energy requirements. We know this isn't true. We've talked about it a lot today. We, while we believe CCS holds great promise as a technology and should, should happen, it is simply not ready to be deployed the way the EPA insists it will be in the near term. And because it's not commercially available, this and all future NSPS for greenhouse gases are essentially a line drawing exercise uh, in what energy we can and we can't use. Right now, EPA is drawing that line to eliminate coal and to allow everything else. But these standards are reviewable every eight years, which means eight years from now, EPA will be redrawing that line. And the same arguments being used to crowd out coal today could very well be used to do the exact same thing to natural gas. Regulations that result in the limitation of coal or gas could pose serious problems for manufacturers. Coal is responsible for 37 percent of our nation's electricity in 2012, followed by gas at 30 percent. These fuels will remain the dominant sources of energy in the U.S. for many years. And the nexus is even more profound at the state level. States where manufacturing is heaviest, places like Indiana, Michigan, Louisiana, Kentucky, Kansas, Pennsylvania, Ohio, well, they use a lot of coal and they use a lot of natural gas. And so now EPA is going to have to draw that line not only in the new fleet, but on the existing fleet of power plants in a little more than six months. Then it'll have to do it for other industrial sectors like refineries and chemical manufacturing, natural gas drilling, iron and steel, aluminum, cement, pulp and paper, glass, food processing, and many others. That's why we frequently say that manufacturers will be hit twice by these regulations, both as users of the energy being regulated and as industries considered next in line to receive similar regulations from EPA on their own plants. And that's why the choices EPA is making in this rule matter. Legal issues like when a technology is adequately demonstrated and what, can, what constitutes significant endangerment matter beyond just this rule. Because every sector has a stretch technology that doesn't make a lot of financial sense right now but would theoretically reduce emissions. So is this now what NSPS is going to require for each of them? Now, I suspect that the members of the subcommittee, both Republican and Democrat, would prefer that EPA take a different approach to greenhouse gases than it has done so far. I still believe you can do something about it. We at NAM support the, the, the Whitfield Mansion Bill, which allows EPA to regulate greenhouse gases but ensures that the regulations are done smarter and better. Now, opponents are calling this a repeal bill. That, that's not true. This bill doesn't repeal anything. For new power plants, it requires separate standards for coal and gas with subcategorization. It provides a reasonable path forward for CCS, which allows EPA to require it, but only when it's truly ready. And finally, it allows EPA to craft rules or guidelines for existing power plants. It doesn't stop them from doing it. It just gives Congress a say over when, when they're okay and when they can say go. The Whitfield Mansion Bill, at the end of the day, would give manufacturers regulatory certainty by preserving an all the above policy. Had the proposed rule that we're, we're discussing today looked like the, that portion of the Whitfield Mansion Bill, I think we're having a different conversation. By enacting this bill, Congress can steer the EPA toward an end result that accomplishes long-term meaningful reductions in greenhouse gas emissions while preserving a healthy and robust manufacturing sector. Thanks. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, and thank all of you for uh, taking time to be with us and for your testimony. Uh, Attorney General Pruitt, uh, Ms. McCabe uh, talked about the cooperative uh, spirit with the states. And I know that many states that I've heard from are quite concerned about uh, EPA setting standards and not working in a cooperative way, becoming more and more aggressive with states. What has your experience been? Would you classify your experience with EPA uh, on recent uh, rules and regulations in a cooperative way, or has it been an adversarial way? How would you describe it? Well, Mr. Chairman, two responses. I think under 111D, it's very clear that Congress intended that cooperative federalism be alive and well as it relates to that particular section. Our experience with regional haze, uh, the regional haze rule that I mentioned in my comments, demonstrates that the EPA has taken a different approach with respect to respecting the role of the states in cooperative federalism. Under that rule, as you know, uh, the states are authorized to uh, determine the methodology, the, the process, the plan, 
to meet the guidelines that you in Congress and the agency has set, which is natural visibility by the year 2064. Oklahoma did just that in the year 2010 and beat the deadline by decades. But the EPA rejected the plan and simultaneously forced and endeavored to force upon the state of Oklahoma a federal plan that would cost $2 billion, primarily because, Mr. Chairman, in my estimation, uh, fuel diversity was maintained. Coal plants along natural gas were maintained, fossil fuels were being utilized in the plan, and the EPA didn't like that and rejected the plan. So though we've talked a lot about uh, that today, Ms. McCabe made reference to cooperative federalism. I guess I'll draw upon President Reagan's comment in the 80s about trust but verify with respect to foreign policy. Uh, the states have routinely endeavored to trust and work with the EPA, but in response, particularly around the Clean Air Act and the Regional Haze Program, it has not been demonstrated that they are, in fact, respecting the state's role. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Pruitt. And Mr. Hawkins, you uh, and Mr. Eisenberg, I want to thank you for your <laughs> comment. But you, you used the word repeal, that we were repealing their authority, EPA's authority, under our legislation. And we actually don't re repeal it. We set some parameters, and on the uh, existing plants, uh, the only power that Congress would have would to set be to set the effective date. But, you know, in a larger context, uh, all of us understand that coal is not being used as much today, certainly for new plants, because uh, natural gas prices are so low. We, we definitely understand that. And uh, I think Mr. McKinley made a great point. 805 billion tons of CO2 emissions each year, about 3.5 percent of that is man-made, and fossil fuel U.S. coal plant emissions amounts to like two-tenths of a percent. So then it raises the question of moving forward. We, we live in a very unpredictable world. We don't know what is going to happen. Why should the U.S. be the only country in the world that has standards uh, so stringent on emissions that practically you cannot build a new coal-powered plant? As I said in my opening statement, Europe's closing down 30 gigawatts of natural gas plants, mothballing them because of high natural gas prices, and they're building more coal-powered plants. And so why are we taking these extreme efforts that would basically eliminate coal from a new, a new opportunities only in America? Uh, and I'd like to hear all of you, if you want to make a brief, yeah, Ms. Hawkins, you go right ahead. Uh, well, to begin, uh, the United States is not the only country that is requiring um, carbon capture uh, performance on coal plants. Uh, the United Kingdom does, and our neighbor to the north, Canada, does. Both of those countries have in place uh, uh, rules and... But are the emission standards as stringent as, as here? Uh, the are, Canadian are you standards... Saying that a new coal, could you build a turk plant in Canada? The or? Canadian standards apply to new plants and to existing plants after they reach uh, 40 years of life. Well, let me just say, I, we can talk about this some more. I've had some discussions with people about that, and it's my understanding that they're significantly uh, different. But uh, I would just tell you, when two-tenths of the emission comes from coal plants in all the emissions worldwide, uh, th this is, in my view, a pretty extreme position. All we're saying is, with our legislation, we want it to be an option that would, people would have the opportunity to utilize it. Mr. Chairman, may I say one word about natural versus man-made? The statistics that you are citing uh, are confusing what are natural fluxes of hundreds of millions of tons that go out of the ocean every year, hundreds of billions of tons that go back into the land every year. There are no net emissions from those huge transfers. The only net emissions are caused by human activities, and man is responsible for 100 percent of the increased emissions. Uh, these natural fluxes have nothing to do with the... All I'm itself. saying is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Energy, Inter Energy Information Administration, and EPA have said 803 billion tons to total uh, emissions and man-made 3.5 percent. Yes, but they include 
equal amounts out and equal amounts in from the natural system. So that those natural systems that are included in those 800 billion add nothing to the atmosphere. So do you feel like you're, uh, are, are you going to, do you think we might be able to do anything with our legislation that you support us? To do what, sir? <laughs> do you think you could do any, we could do anything with our legislation in which you would support us? With your legislation, uh, yes, uh, uh, you could uh, change it around so that you would uh, return to some of the provisions that are in uh, that were in the Waxman-Markey bill, which this committee did report out and uh, this House did approve, uh, with uh, seven or eight Republican votes at the time. Uh, uh, you could turn it into a program that would actually deploy carbon capture and storage, and if you did, we would support it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McInerney, you're recognized for five minutes. I thank the Chairman, and I thank all the witnesses. Uh, I know you're here. Uh, it's a long trip. It's a long day, uh, and it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's an issue with a lot of different perspectives. Um, in 2011, I'm going to direct a question to you first, Mr. Tierney. Uh, the American Electric Power produ uh, proposed to develop a large CCS plant in West Virginia, uh, but had to cancel because, as the CEO explained, without federal carbon pollution standards, it couldn't get recovery for that uh, investment. You do work with executives. Is that a typical uh, experience? Yes, it's common if a, a regulated utility it does not see that they're required to do something, they have a difficult time making a case before regulators about a cost associated with that. So that was what was behind the AEP decision uh, to cancel that project. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that the rules, uh, the EPA rules, will address public health and help ensure that coal and natural gas remain viable. Would you expand on that a little bit? Yes. R right now, it's clearly the case that, as I mentioned, if the, the investment choices that are being made by the electric industry are for renewables and natural gas projects. Coal is just simply too expensive, too large a capital investment to make, and too risky with regard to what will happen with a, uh, controls on carbon in the future. So having certainty, such as that which EPA will be introducing with their guidance on existing rules, excuse me, guidance on existing plants and their regulations on new plants will provide a framework under which people can make investments, push technology forward so that eventually we can uh, find a time when uh, coal and natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration can go forward. And I'm speaking of coal when I say that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, you mentioned that uh, the benefits, uh, basically the, the economic benefits outweighed the cost. I think you mentioned a $20 billion benefit for a specific case uh, compared to a $4 billion cost. Could you describe that a little bit? Uh, uh, yes, uh, this was an analysis that uh, NRDC uh, did of, of, a, of an approach to uh, regulating existing power plants. Uh, and those 25 to $60 billion benefits were a combination of health benefits associated with reduced soot and smog pollution from uh, the power plants that, whose emissions would be cut, as well as climate protection benefits based on the administration's uh, earlier uh, social cost of carbon uh, calculations on what is the benefit of reducing a ton of carbon. Those were the earlier benefits uh, costs, not the, not the current uh, higher costs. So that was the basis of the conclusion. Uh, it does cost something. It's not a free program. Uh, but $4 billion in a several hundred billion dollar a year industry is definitely a, di a digestible cost, and when you compare that to the 25 to $60 billion in public health and climate protection benefits, this is a bargain. Thank you. Well, um, this is the next one's going to be addressed to you as well. Uh, in 2008, coal supporters trumpeted new technologies to reduce carbon emissions from coal while providing affordable electricity. Now, there was a lot of optimism at that point. I'd like to show uh, an another TV advertisement that was produced in 2008 from the coal industry. I believe in the future. In the future. I believe in protecting the environment. I believe in energy independence. I believe that meeting a challenge brings out the best in us. I believe. I believe we can use American energy resources. 
I believe we can limit greenhouse gases. We will do this. I believe in technology. I believe. We will do this. I believe we will do this. With new technologies, we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions and keep energy costs affordable. We will do this. We will do this. I believe. I believe in American ingenuity. I believe we can do it. I believe it can happen. I believe. I believe. I believe. We can be energy independent. We can continue to use our most abundant fuel cleanly and responsibly. We can, we will. Clean coal, America's power. So what that shows is that the coal industry was willing to spend money to put out advertising on TV to promote this. Uh, it was a lot of optimism in 2008. Um, where uh, was the coal industry right? Did they have the technology uh, ready to go, or was that uh, uh, a fantasy at that time? As far as carbon capture and storage is concerned, I still believe it. Where did all that uh, spirit and optimism go? Well, uh, unfortunately, when, when faced with a, a requirement to actually uh, uh, perform to these promises, the industry has taken a very short-sighted view and basically said, no, what we want to do is block EPA. Uh, and the, the legislation would prevent the power sector uh, customers of coal, of coal to actually be able to finance plants because those plants uh, would uh, not be uh, uh, in anticipation of any future EPA regulation. Uh, because EPA couldn't consider the results if there was any government money in them, and the financing wouldn't happen unless there were some government money because there were no requirements. It's a perfect catch-22. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Olson, for five minutes. I thank the chair and welcome to our witnesses. I know it's been a long morning, so I'd like to pick you up with the green we say in Texas. Howdy, y'all. <laughs> My first question is for you, Mr. Eisenberg. As you know, sir, we have the world's strongest economy and highest quality of life because we have cheap, reliable sources of power. Reliable power is a matter of life and death, in many cases, for average Americans. But below that, cheap, reliable power is critical the manufacturing revival we're seeing all along America and along the Texas Gulf Coast, the whole Gulf Coast. No company would invest in a multi-billion dollar project if they have to constantly rely on backup generators or worried about the power going out. Can you describe how electric reliability and rates impact investment decisions? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for the question. For uh, many manufacturers, and, and certainly a substantial portion of my membership, for many of them, energy is their single greatest expense. Um, so, you know, they're going to go and they're going to build and they're going to expand where energy is reliable, where it's affordable, uh, and, 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 yeah, I mean, where they can get it and where they can get it cheaply. Uh, I listed, I don't know, five or six states uh, in, my, in my testimony where you, there's this unbelievably evident nexus between coal, natural gas, manufacturing. If you look at a map, I mean, I could have listed 25 states. I could have listed 35 states. If you look at a map, that's where the manufacturing is. Uh, it is where energy is inexpensive. And I'm not saying that it only has to be those two. There are plenty of places in the Northeast and in the West, in the Pacific Northwest, where we're using hydropower and renewables and, and other things like that and nuclear. Um, but, but energy matters. It matters a lot to manufacturers. It may not be the only thing that matters, but for a lot of them, it's a very, very, very large part of why they make a decision to locate in a certain place or to expand in a certain place. Thank you for the answer, sir. Uh, question for you, Mr. Campbell. Um, you mentioned your testimony that your utility serves some of the neatest people in Kentucky. And I know that during the recession, the number of people behind their electric, electric bills skyrocketed, exploded. It is a real cost to consumers and your consumers in particular. Can you tell me how price sensitive residents you serve, how, how the, let me rephrase this, can you tell me how price sensitive 
the residents you serve are. I mean, how much does it hurt them if prices go up? Well, the people we serve are some of the poorest people in Kentucky, and cooperatives by their nature are, serve a lot of the poorer part of the country. But, but uh, let me give you a relation to our East Kentucky Power Cooperative. Over the last decade, we've, we've doubled the price of our power, and a large portion of that is because of the consent decree that forced us to put on some of the scrubbers for nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide early. We would have had to have done that either, but we did it early. Um, and, it, and they are very sensitive to being able to afford our power. And, and if we look at CO2 right now, and I'll just use the, the uh, president's suggestion of, 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 of a cap-and-trade program and $38 uh, a ton for CO2, uh, our revenue this year is about $900 million. Uh, and if we had $38 a ton uh, tax on top of that for every CO2 ton that we release, that would increase us about $470 million. So that's going to be another 50% rate increase on some of the poorest people in the country. And um, so, so they're going to have to start to choose, can they afford medicine, can they afford food, or are they going to afford electricity? So basically, their whole life is impacted dramatically by these increase in costs. I mean, they might, as you said, they might not buy health care, which means they'll be more prone to all the bad problems we have in our health care industry right now. They won't have the jobs. I mean, this is not just something that's in Kentucky. This is all across the country. That's correct. And my final question, I've got 25 seconds here, is for you, Dr. Vandevart. Um, the EPA has very concrete benefits to claim, a few of them, in the pro's new plant rule. It will, however, help them check an important box. EPA crows in the proposal that one benefit is that, and this is a quote, the proposed rule will also serve as a necessary predicate for the regulation of existing resources. This rule, that's the end quote, has always been about cutting new plants off at the knees so they can focus on existing ones. As we consider the costs and benefits of the new plant rule, should we also be considering the costs of a sweeping rule on existing plants? <laughs> yes, I, obviously under Section 111D, the states, when implementing this standard, have the, the, the duty to consider costs. Um, I think that what you raise is, a, is an interesting um, facet of the news source. It is a required predicate for the EPA to pursue a 111D uh, uh, program for existing sources. Uh, I think it's also a predicate to their true desire, which is a cap and trade. And they're trying to use a very stringent news source standard, perhaps, as a bogey for that. And they're trying to uh, they're trying to use the word flexibility to hide the, the, the desire of including off the fence or off the property reductions uh, that go into a cap and trade so called target. Thanks, sir. I'm way above my time. I'm much obliged for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. This time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank our panel. Uh, Mr. Eisenberg, there's concern about regulations that have economic impact on manufacturers and, and of course, the cost of their electricity, like you just said. Um, are any of your members manufacturer, uh, manufacturers of CCS technology? They are. Um, has that been, uh, are they optimistic about the economic output related to the manufacture of this technology moving forward? You know, they, they, they are. Uh, they, they like like NAM, believe that, that we can have this technology and that, that it can work. The issue is when. Um, you know, and, and, and one thing that, that has come up throughout the, the course here is, you know, this bill actually is relatively consistent with what everybody else has been saying as to when this thing, when CCS has been, been held and when a lot of my members are telling me that as well. Uh, EPA in last year's rule said that CCS would be available eight years from whenever the rule was enacted, 2020, 2022. 2020, uh, Wax and Markey would have required, I think, four gigawatts of, uh, of, of demonstrated and achievable uh, CCS, and then wouldn't require it for four years after that. So this is entirely consistent. Our, our members, so it's a long-winded way of getting to, our members do think that we can get there. I think we can get there. 
I just don't think we're there right now. Okay. Uh, Dr. Turney, the current EPA proposal created separate categories for natural gas and coal. In this legislation, there's a further subdivision of coal. Now, if you can't tell from my accent, uh, I'm from Texas and we burn dirt and call it coal. Uh, but natural gas has been our fuel of choice and it's grown substantially. Um, does, does the additional category have any economic cost or benefit to it? To whom was that addressed? Uh, um, uh, Dr. Turney, Ms. Turney. Oh, I'm, so I'm sorry. Um, it, because I wasn't expecting this to come to me, did you say at the very end that this raises costs? Well, no, I wanted to know, uh, by creating a further category, the current EPA proposal separates categories of natural gas and coal. In this legislation, the further subdivision of coal, does this additional category have any economic cost or benefit to it if there's a separate Yes, I think it does have a benefit to it because it allows for a different treatment of coal relative to, to natural gas uh, by, by size and category of technology. So yes, it does provide uh, more flexibility inherently with those two categories. Well, that uh, concerns me somewhat, but Mr. Pruitt, in Texas, we have lots of natural gas and we're discovering more and more each day. And I know Oklahoma is our neighbor, and if y'all would leave our football players at home, we'd be really happy. But uh, We don't want to do that, Mr. <laughs> uh, natural gas continues to expand its footprint uh, for fuel, for power generation. Can you comment on the role of natural gas in your state's power generation fuel mix? I mean, I think the, the key issue, and I'm speaking more from a, um, as Attorney General, many of us across the country represent rate payers yeah. before our respective corporation commissions as these types of discussions ensue. And, and I think the most important thing is fuel diversity. I, I think the utilities need the ability to choose between natural gas and coal, other forms of energy to provide energy, uh, electricity to their consumers. I think when policy is being used, regulation is being used to pick winners and losers, elevating certain energy over others, it is detrimental ultimately to consumers in our respective states. Well, and I can see that the other issue is that we've had environmental laws for many years, and this would overlay it with carbon. And, and I know you don't do some of the things in producing electricity that, I mean, like Knox, uh, th that cost, uh, that was built into the cost of our utility providers. Uh, but carbon would just be an added, carbon sequestration or control would be just added additional cost. But if you're comparing a coal with natural gas or wind, and I don't know western Oklahoma very well, but I know west Texas and parts of south Texas, and the wind power growth has just been amazing. Um, that We know there's no carbon problems with wind or even solar if someday we get to it in our part of the country. But natural gas is half the carbon footprint of, for example, coal. Uh, so natural gas would probably be the fuel of choice if we ended up going more for carbon sequestration. And I, I think that is, in fact, happening as far as utility companies uh, because of the low cost of natural gas presently. Yeah. But it's based uh, on cost now, not because of the environmental impact, I guess, of natural gas. Perhaps, but I think that baseload energy between coal and natural gas, fossil fuels generally, it's ultimately very important to utility companies to have the ability to choose what is the best source of their energy as they provide the, uh, the, the electricity to the consumers. And, you know, Congressman, I think the, the issue for the states is that, that ultimately there is a role for us to play. It's been recognized here today by Ms. McCabe and others, and we see uh, under the Regional Hayes Program, and we, we're concerned about under this particular proposed rule, that the state's role will be diminished and that, that the cost-benefit analysis will be uh, not properly addressed by the EPA, and that's the reason we're concerned about that prospectively. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm over time. The gentleman's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would point out several times folks have said that uh, obviously folks want to build, or power companies want to build uh, gas power plants, which is certainly true because of the cost of, of natural gas. But I also think, and uh, Mr. Campbell, I'm going to direct this question towards you, I also think that uh, power companies would be looking more at coal if they thought they could build something that would be effective because the price uh, most recent that I have is September was uh, 362 per 1,000 cubic feet for natural gas, and experts have previously testified in front of this committee at $4. You're at a position where you're breaking even on the production of the energy between coal and natural gas, 
And a couple times this year, we've actually gotten up to that $4 level and that people project over the next few years that we probably will break that $4 uh, level on natural gas. And isn't it true that most uh, electric power companies like to have a diversity uh, so that if natural gas prices spike, they can rely on coal, and if coal prices spike, they can rely on natural gas and, and also look to other resources. Is that, not, is that not true? Is my understanding correct? That's absolutely correct. And in, in fact, our strategy in, in Kentucky, in East Kentucky, is to diversify our portfolio naturally. We'll probably go to a little bit more natural gas because we realize there's regulatory risks out there, too. But we think a healthy diversity of fuel is good for all of, all of us. Now, your headquarters is a little bit outside of my district, but I do touch uh, eastern Kentucky, uh, down on the southern, uh, southwestern end of my district. Um, and I also represent a lot of folks who are struggling to make ends meet. And you believe that these new regulations, if we don't pass uh, the Whitman uh, Mansion bill, will cause the electric prices to go up for those people, don't you? I do believe that they will make naturally make costs for those people to go up. I believe the new source performance standards with low natural gas, if you assume that, will go to gas, and that will probably keep the rates steady. But if you look into the future and we all run to have a mad dash to gas because we're not going to clean our coal plants up with CCS, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, uh, that's going to drive costs up. And the, the programs, in, in my area at least, if we get a cold winter, the programs that help people heat their homes who can't afford it, they don't last all winter. Is that true in your area as well? We do. They, they run out of funding, and churches help, and, and some pitches. people just have to live with less electricity. And what they do is they end up crowding into one room, several people, or if it's an elderly person living alone, they just, they just heat one room. Isn't that what they do in that your area correct. as well? That is correct. Yes, and sir. That, and that's a shame, isn't it? Yes, sir. And policies from the federal government really ought not do that to people where they, they're, they make these choices. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And you've seen studies that also would show that that affects their health, doesn't it? It does. To an, in a negative way, not a positive. Yes. Electricity has really increased the life expectancy of the people of the United States. You, no one can not say that electricity hasn't improved our lives. And affordable electricity makes that even better. I That's correct. That. Uh, Dr. Vandervart, uh, if I might ask you as a regulator and as a lawyer, as a legal matter under Section 111D, the issue in terms of setting carbon dioxide standards of performance is what is achievable at an existing electric generating unit. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And I would ask both you and uh, Attorney General Pruitt, as regulators, uh, can you discuss your concerns about the EPA seeking to regulate beyond the scope of its authority in planned regulations of existing electric generating units? Uh, I'd just like to say, uh, at the, if it is in fact passes the legal thresholds I referred to, the issue is that the Clean Air Act only provides authority for a reduction feasible by the Institute of Technology on the emission unit. What I heard earlier today is that a target, which is a euphemistic way of saying a limit, will be set by the federal government. That's my uh, experience as well. If, however, in setting that limit, the EPA includes the entire system, uh, demand-side management, you're going to have a number that's absolutely unachievable at a single unit. And, and I understand that, Attorney General. Congressman, I, you know, I would say that the EPA may require the states to adopt standards. Uh, the EPA may guide the states on how to do that procedurally. Uh, but ultimately, the states are vested with the legal authority to decide the ultimate standards. And I think that's what's important as we talk about these 111D discussions we're having. Well, and I appreciate that very much. In regard to uh, CCS, uh, I, I would agree with you, Mr. Eisenberg. We may get there someday. We are not there yet. And what we're going to do is we're going to make people in my district and in Mr. Campbell's service area and, and people all over the United States pay more for electricity, and that's going to negatively impact not only the, the amount of money in their household, but also, as we've heard today, it's going to affect negatively their health and, and their viability in, in the world. And so it's... Uh, it's a real shame that uh, some people are opposed to this really good bill that uh, Chairman Whitman has introduced. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. This time I recognize the gentleman from uh, West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got uh, two reports here, two white papers, one by Dr. Christie and Dr. Bajura uh, on this subject, not asking them to consent they be entered into the, uh, into the record. Mr. Chairman. 
ask these reports be entered into the record. Oh, without objection, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, also, uh, w one of the issues that I've come here as an engineer, and, 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 and I want to make sure we avoid Washington speak, and it happens a lot. It happened in the earlier panel where we were just trying to get a direct answer about whether or not under the new source performance standard was going to increase the cost of the, of the production of coal, coal-fired generated electricity. Um, and she wouldn't give us the answer. So my question, the two of you that are engineers on the panel, would you say that if the new source performance standard goes into effect, will it cost more for those power plants that use coal Uh, Would yes, the cost of increase, cost of electricity increase. Yes. Thank you. And you? Uh, absolutely. Why can't people just say that straight up? Why is Washington speak be so confusing? We just thank you for that. Let me, uh, Mr. Vanderbilt, uh, you had studying your your body language on it uh, in some of the testimony from Mr. Hawkins that you seem like you might disagree with some of his his comments. Uh, would you like to expound a little bit? Uh, on the clarifying some of his the statements? I think my comments covered uh, my position pretty well. Again, I'm very concerned whether there is any legal authority for the EPA to do what they're doing, uh, both in the existing source category, but also even in the way that they are promoting the, uh, the new source uh, requirements. Who, um, let, let me close in the time frame I have. But I, I'm maybe open to the panel. Uh, if, if all of these regulations are imposed and we decarbonize America, who wins? Because the carbon is still going to be generated around the world. We know that Russia and China are going to continue. So who wins? Our workers are going to lose their jobs. Our manufacturing is going to lose its edge uh, because the cost of electricity is going to go up. So who wins? Mr. Hawkins, can, can you tell me who wins? The American people will win. Uh, if, if they don't have a job, and they win? I'll, I'll, I'll explain why I believe that. Um, Make yeah, sure, please, so enough that I can hear I'll do it quickly. the people on the, the panel. The United States has an incredibly successful model with the Clean Air Act, and we have, this is not just theory. We have proven that when the United States steps out and demonstrates to the rest of the world that it is possible to use American ingenuity to deploy technology to clean up our big pollution sources, protect public health, and improve the economy at the same time. Other countries get it, and they follow, and it helps everyone. And when you think about the fact that the United States has put more carbon pollution into the air cumulatively compared to any other country, it's our turn to lead, and we will be able to innovate and move the rest of the world with us. You really, uh, okay, I'm, I'm just curious. Mr. Campbell, how about you? Who wins? Well, um, let me say, long term, I think everyone could win. But this, let's just look at the Clean Air Act. We say, I, I, and I understand a lot of people say, boy, if you, just, in, if you just do this, the technology will come. Build it and they will come. Look, the Clean Air Act came, and uh, Congressman Waxman said this morning in 1974. That's correct. And it was 40 years, and we had somewhat of a proven technology. Now we don't have that. And they're trying to shrink that time down on everybody, and we're just going to do it. And, and I don't think that can happen. And I think, I think we'll be a loser. I think we have to keep the economy of the United States strong so we can find these technologies, so we yeah. can help the world. If you look at nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide and particulate matter cleanup that we did, China's not building a lot of those plants with that back-end equipment. I mean, I've been trying to sell a coal plant that I have right now overseas. Okay. None of them want the back-end equipment. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Mr. Ch 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 Chichanowitz? Yeah, I... Am I close on that? My, pretty my close. I, in part, is, is not only who wins, but also I want... Are you satisfied? I, I don't... I, 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 again, your body language, you seem to be concerned whether or not we've actually demonstrated... Uh, enough process that we're ready to implement. Uh, you know that uh, uh, Ernie Moniz came out last week and said it's ready. The, it, it, we're ready to implement carbon capture. Uh, and I got the sense you don't agree with that. 
No, certainly I don't. And I, you know, we've had some comments all the morning about how if the power industry would just get to work on things, the problems would go away. Certainly you can deploy many advanced technologies. It just takes time. All these have risk and you can go back to selective catalytic reduction in scrubbers. Yes, they're successful now, but everybody keeps forgetting that took a while. It took decades to sort out the problems. And I think, you know, in my testimony, I was clear, maybe we'll have an answer in 2020. We don't know yet. But it, it just takes time to do the work and, and understand the risks and come up with possible solutions. Thank you very much. I, my time's expired. The gentleman's time's expired. And well, that uh, conclude, uh, concludes today's hearing. I want to thank all of you for being focused on uh, the issue and for your uh, time and effort. I know many of you travel long distances, but uh, we do appreciate it. And uh, Mr. McNerney, you have some documents you want to enter to the record. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to enter two uh, into the record two letters from organizations expressing concerns with and opposition to the proposed bill due to its anticipated negative effects on climate and public health. The first is a letter from the American Lung Association, American Public Health Association, and other health and medical associations. The other is a letter from 79 environmental groups and other organizations on behalf of their members and supporters. Without objections, uh, so ordered. Thank you. And then I also would like to enter into the record. I know the NRDC, in their testimony, had included a proposal uh, relating to these issues. And we have the uh, National Eco Economic Research Associates did an analysis and, and a letter from the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity relating to that. And then uh, I would also uh, like to enter into the record uh, letters from the U.S. Chamber, the National Association of Manufacturers, and the Fertilizer Institute uh, about the discussion draft. And then uh, did you all get copies of the uh, documents that Mr. McKinley wanted to introduce? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we, we uh, got those late, so we'd like to have a chance to review those. Okay. So you all can uh, review them, and we'll re uh, keep the record open for... Uh, three days and oh, 10 days remind members they have 10 days to submit questions for the record and I ask that witnesses all agree to respond to any questions we may have for you all uh, if you would so thank you again and I know that we'll be seeing you again as we go along working on these issues the hearings adjourn